Hi everyone, Christine here. I just wanted to step in before today's episode to remind you to please register to vote. There is still time, but not much. And with the monumental loss of Justice Ginsburg this week, it's more important now than ever to use our hurt as fuel and take action. For an easy way to register in your state, visit bit.ly slash and that's why we vote. That's bit.ly slash and that's why we vote. Let me tap the eyes a little bit. (laughs) What the hell? Wake up a little bit. Uh, Tim, you need me to smack you in the eyes. In my, my pocket sockets? Again, why do we always talk about <laughs> eyeballs? <laughs> this time he starts recording ahead of time. Uh, yeah, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> we should have known. Okay, I feel more awake. Do you? You sure you don't want me to I feel a little more in pain. punch you in the eyes a little more? Like whatever you're doing over there? Don't judge me going on i just need a little a a little coolant oh i feel better now (laughs) yeah asmr (laughs) kaylin's like please don't pour water all over the microphone no 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 no. we're good now i need a little cool a little cold air so worked out working well for you yeah i'm good now i'm ready to party i'm back let's rage Rage. okay Welcome to our biblical podcast. Where we rage. Where we rage hard against the machine. I'm yeah. Christine. I, I'm me. And spelled backwards, it's M. That's right. Um and also This is why we drink, and that's why we drink. That's th- what it's called, sort uh-huh. of a little bit. Um, how are you, Christine? Listen, I'm great. Thank you for asking. How how has your day been? How's well, it going? I've spent it every mo- waking moment with you. So And sleeping moment. And sleeping every waking and unconscious moment we spent together christine yesterday after we recorded she was like i am a little scared to sleep in the apartment by myself and i went okay sleepover and then i did the whole like (laughs) no you don't have to and i was like can you just shut up i'm coming i was like you already made it clear i'm coming it's fine poor eva came over and then went home alone so well you also got locked out of our apartment for like 20 minutes oh my god with all of your stuff with multiple suitcases yeah it was really a mess poor eva had to come like rescue me yeah I um, was not going to. I didn't even see Like an text. hour and a half later, I was like, oh my God, are you still outside? And I was like, Eva, I should send a picture of that you I, on, the of on the sidewalk. Yeah. And the security man who, by the way, came out and was like, what are you? And I was inside a bush. Okay. Listen. Why? I don't want to know. Never mind. Because it was comfier than sitting on the floor. Listen, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Was it our security guard? Like No, it was for building? another building where they were like, what are oh. you doing over there? I think <laughs> he was just living my best it life. It was very dark out and I was not behaving like a normal citizen. Anyway, I was going to say something. Oh, yeah. So this comes out later, but we have a newsletter. Yes. And uh, we're sending out today that we're recording. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Um, and so by the time this comes out, it'll have already Existed been out. And maybe even the, the second month is coming out. Yeah. So uh, second what is wrong with me? I hear what you're saying and no one else is, but that's okay. We have a newsletter coming out, and by the time this episode comes out, it will have already existed in the in the cybersphere for and quite a while. Multiple. Like, Maybe we there might, might be, be many. Too. We're we're trying to do a lot of these in a row, so I don't even know when this episode comes Our out. Our lovely friend Jessica is making these wonderful newsletters, and yes. we have a patron of the month in there. We have a pet of the month, milkshake of the month, or milkshake, of, yeah, milkshake wine of the mm. month, and like um. It's really fun. So yes, <laughs> go we've to- got a lot of good stuff coming. That's right. I think on our website, it's on there. And that's where drink.com if you want to sign up. Yeah. Um, I'm just very, I've always wanted a newsletter. I think it's something I didn't know I wanted. Like I wanted, but I didn't know I wanted. It's, it'll be fun. It's going to be fun. So anyway, please check that out. Um, also on our website, you can sign up for the newsletter, correct? Oh yeah. That's what I meant. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe you did say, and I just wasn't listening. This is going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that being said, I am so amped about my this story. Like, why? I think that's why my brain is not here because I've been like waiting to do this one since like a very early, very hey. early episode. You'll see. I can't tell you yet, but I'm just. Will I know it? Yes. Okay. Oh, wow. That's new. Okay. Like, oh, so sexy. Su- oh, was it subtle, but not subtle at all. Mm, but very sexy. Uh, definitely makes uh, it's it's a crowd pleaser. <laughs> If I it, to any crowd that I'm not in, it's I'm a, a showstopper. <laughs> to any crowd that does not include me, um, uh-huh. I am winking. It's memorable, and I find it very attractive. The wink is just—it's always a little too slow, and the smile is a little too pronounced. <laughs> like your face, like your mouth is saying, 
I'm doing it. Like this. Look at what I'm up to. Watch, watch. That's what my See, mouth. Your face does it. it goes like <laughs> uh, like uh, I'm doing. It. Anyway, well, welcome to our show. And my favorite is after you've drank some wine, the, the eyelid never comes back up. It yeah, just- <laughs> it actually does kind of just stay down there. That's right. I'm like, okay, time to go to bed. And now that we've had enough sleepovers, you've definitely seen that when I wake up. Were you in a towel this morning? Yes. Huh. I was up for like four hours. And then the moment I walked out, grabbed something in a towel, you were like, ah, and I was like, super good time. <laughs> I thought I was having a dream. Whatever. You did just like immediately not go back to sleep not exist anymore so i guess i probably just scared you back into your unconscious mind i also didn't sleep with a blanket last night i really (laughs) am literally wrapped themselves in t-shirts as blankets it was a rough 24 hours we've had i realized once i got to your place i forgot forgot to bring a blanket and christine had a blanket that was already too small for just like a tiny spongebob blanket and we had a box full of like and that's why we drink t-shirts so i just put the pile on my body and i was like (laughs) I woke up and I was like, it was just like t-shirts it was like strewn I about. I dumped a box of shirts on me. With no t-shirts on them, just like laying there amidst all the t-shirts. I was like, this has worked out very well for there, me. There were so many shirts that felt like um like a, a gravity blanket. It just felt heavy. <laughs> and also like, it's a t-shirt, so it fits me this much. Like yeah. was, So my legs, <laughs> really I slept with nothing. It really didn't work. But I felt like if I had something heavy on my chest, I would forget that the rest of me was, Uncovered. I could fall asleep faster. Yeah. Anyway. If you like a shirt that smells like me, go to We mattress. really need to buy a mattress for that place. We keep sleeping on the same air mattress, and I swear my poor almost 30-year-old back is having a hard time. We should get a mattress for that place. <laughs> Write that down. It's a temporary fi- It's a Band-Aid. So anyway, <sighs> this is um my story. This is a uh, mystery conspiracy Ooh, situation. That's fun. Um, So this is, and I will probably say it wrong, but this is the story of the SS Oorong Madan. Whoa, a boat? It's either Medan or Madan, but I think it's Madan. Yes, it is a boat. Fun. Um, so let's talk about it there uh, because this is what please my, this is my job. Let's. Um, so uh, there is a stretch of water between Malaysia and an e- Indonesian island called Sumatra, mm-hmm. called the Strait of Malacca. Oh, and uh, it's been the main shipping channel between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean since the 17th century. Uh, and 90, over 94,000 vessels, fun fact, uh, travel the strait every year still. It's wow. the busiest strait in the world and carries about a quarter of the world's traded goods. I can imagine there might be a haunted boat in the mix if there were that many people. There just might be. <laughs> hey, hey. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. Continue. Over the centuries, uh, many incidents with pirates uh have happened on this mm. strait even up until i think 2006 was the last documented pirate bonanza i don't know what they're called the <laughs> not that <laughs> the pirate a, a pirate takeover what do they call what do we say in the last episode a quilting party uh, oh a quilting frolic those are those call that obviously it's they a pirate quilting the frolic. pirates they wanted to do a little quilting they wanted to frolic they did it as of 2006 Listen, they were M uses it. t-shirts as blankets so if they want to quilt let them Look, it's a quilting. Fro- We're gonna make me a blanket at the next quilting frolic. That's right. So, um, and so this straight, I guess, over the last several centuries. I don't know if this is the last over se- over the last several centuries or a-, a smaller time frame. But it says there's been at least thirty four shipwrecks, and I'm like, in several centuries, only oh. thirty four sounds kind of good to me. Yeah, I don't really know the statistics of that, but I I don't know ships. I would agree with you, but I would imagine like been around since the 17th century and not even 40 shipwrecks well i guess a shipwreck is like a big shipwreck where right it could, goes. there could be a Maybe lot of a couple wrecks. yeah right. <laughs> a couple canoe conundrums canoe that kind of came through you uh-huh. know canoe or, conundrums and yes, raft wrecks that's what i said yeah that's yeah. what i say yeah, all yeah, the yeah. time um or also tell me even if it's not good or funny kayak 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 attack kayak attack what were you gonna say <laughs> i don't fucking know you just gave me a word and hoped i'd <laughs> run with it a, a boat bonanza a boating bonanza listen i was already on it with i said so before. i guess what i'm saying is maybe there were 34 like big shipwreck like yes. ships and not like holy shit shipwrecks wrecks. and like you know how there's a, like a fender bender maybe they had a couple uh, fender benders in there too i think they probably had at least 100 fender benders. at least 100 for sure a couple raft wrecks for sure, for sure. 
Christine, and look at your feet. I'm waltzing into fall with my Rothies. Waltzing or sprinting? I'm confused. Not sprint. I certainly am not sprinting. I might be tripping, but... Christine said today, she was like, oh, I'm wearing my Rothies. And I was like, Christine, yesterday, weren't you wearing another pair of Rothies? I was like, I traveled with only two pairs of Rothies, so I don't know why I'm even specifying. Also, but Eva's wearing Rothies today. We are all wearing them. Um, Rothies are my favorite thing. Basically, they come in an ever-changing array of colors, prints, and patterns, and a range of styles. Um, they are comfortable, washable, sustainable. You can put them in the washing machine and they're made out of recycled plastic water bottles. Do you still in like the the aisles at a grocery store, if someone points to your shoes, do you still start with they're made from water bottles? Yeah. Oh, I, I actually, <laughs> I don't even start. I start. Uh-huh. And you just people, tap on people's shoulders and excuse go, me? excuse me. Yeah. I see you're buying water bottles. Why do that? When, when you can wear shoes. When you can wear shoes. That's right. That's, That's what I say. It's actually really smooth and I've made a lot of friends. Not. Uh, Rothy's has kept over 60 million single-use plastic bottles out of landfills and transformed them into their signature thread. And they also make beautiful bags now, which is my next plan. Oh, my God. So now I'll you're going to tap people. Out. You're gonna ta- tap people's shoulders in the grocery store twice now and be like, also, you could just put them in a plastic <laughs> bottle bag while wearing your plastic bottle shoes. What is shoes? wrong with all of you that aren't doing this thing that I'm doing? Also, you already mentioned this, but Rothy's are also fully machine washable. Mm-hmm, and part. so every time they need a refresh, you can simply toss them in the wash so, machine and you are squeaky clean again. That's right. And I sweat a lot. So it's, it's very necessary action. <laughs> um, check out all the amazing shoes and bags available right now at rothys.com slash drink. That's rothys.com, R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash drink. Style and sustainability meet to create your new favorites head to rothys.com slash drink today i realized i had some eye problems because i was looking at screens constantly i do too yeah we both do because all we do whether we're watching tv tv relaxing or working right staring at a screen or just like avoiding work while doing something different on a screen with all of our social media and games on our phones which i'm sure every single person listening to this understands that exact problem (laughs) so sometimes common symptoms from spending too much time in front of screens include headaches blurry vision dry tired eyes and trouble sleeping check 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 yep and it can um impede your melatonin production which like i need to usually take melatonin to even fall asleep so i feel like Mm -hmm. felix gray has actually really changed my life for the better yeah. Oh, thank God we have Felix Grays. They are, uh, there are a lot of blue light glasses on the market, but they're not all created equal and many light, uh, and many blue light glasses don't filter enough blue light, especially in the range that matters. Right. Um, actually the screens produce most blue light at a certain point, uh, in the spectrum of like 555 nanometers. Four Can you tell? Five, but- 455 nanometers close <laughs> not a scientist obviously <laughs> um but most clear blue light lenses only filter about two to three percent in that range and yeah felix gray uses a proprietary filtering technology to filter 15 times more blue light in that it's state. honestly amazing they filter out 90 percent of blue light uh in total which and eliminate 99 percent of glare so i mean they are like next level don't skimp out like go for the good one go for the good stuff go for the good stuff they're made of italian acetate like what more do you need from me here <laughs> <laughs> um, you can order them online and they ship with a hard case and lens cloth. Really gorgeous, too, by the way. Very, very chic. like Swanky. Yeah. I'd say swank. I wear them when I travel because I feel like I'm like, oh, I'm actually busy working on the airplane right now. <laughs> you know, I feel very fancy with them. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash drink for the absolute best quality blue light filtering glasses on the market. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash drink. Shipping and returns are totally free at Felix Gray. Felixgrayglasses.com slash drink. So, um, anyway, so this is a very important uh, piece of water property, if if you if you if I say so myself, mm-hmm. uh, and I do, and I do. So, in 1947, there were two U.S. vessels. One was the City of Baltimore and the Silver Star, and they were sailing the Strait. And the Silver Star, this yeah, 1947, the Silver Star picked up a distressed message from a nearby ship that gave no location, but it had a but. Um, it got a message in Morse code <gasps> on its ship. Spooky. Even though I think Morse code was like a normal thing then. But for me, it does feel extra spooky. Like old like, timey. Like, Ew. <laughs> it's probably still a thing. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. I always, I always sometimes. Wow, we're doing it again, huh? It's not good. I often think that like maybe when we hear knocks from ghosts, it's old timey ones too. doing Morse code. I do. I've thought I that I kind of want to learn Morse code think- just so I can understand what's happening i think when we were in new orleans we said that because we heard like weird tapping and we were like Mm. maybe this was a i think i know sos i know sos and that's it yeah me too well fun fact i guess dot 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 dash 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 dot dot okay um yeah so oh yeah so they hear 
So the silver star picks up a distress message, no location given, but a Morse code message shows up. Um, and this is what the message was. All officers, including the captain are dead lying in chart room and bridge, possibly whole crew dead. And then there was nothing for a while. And then some weird scattered Morse code as if they were trying to spell something, but getting weaker. And then in Morse code, they got, I die. <gasps> oh no. Okay. First of all, can you imagine how long that took? Beep, and- beep, beep. <laughs> L like I mean geez <laughs> well I'm thinking like with this Ouija board we were playing yesterday it was uh-huh. just like hey but like right. Morse code to be the same thing I die like it probably you were holding on for dear life just to be able to spell out that you were about to die probably like idea please I oh d- no I die also maybe it wasn't meant to be I die maybe it was like another word and it was, it was autocorrected you know oh, that's a bummer I hate it when my Morse code operation same. system autocorrects you know. <sighs> And so the one word that we know sometimes auto right. <laughs> Um, So the Silver Star, they call nearby listening posts and they are able to triangulate the signal to the Indian Sea, um, which was not near typical shipping lanes mm-hmm. on the strait. They were like some, they shouldn't even be shipping there. Okay. That doesn't make sense. So the Silver Star says that they're going to go check it out. They're going to follow the coordinates and go on this little rescue mission. And hours later, the Silver Star captain finally finds the SS Oorong Madan. And it was now 50 miles from the coordinates that are provided. So it was just drifting this oh, whole time. No. So they already knew something bad was going oh, on. No. Um, the ship didn't look like it had been taken over from like a pirate bonanza, but it <laughs> did. There were no signs of people. So they knew that like, okay, even if the ship doesn't look destroyed, there's... Some, like, Something bad. Has- we should see someone. Yeah. Um, so the Silver Star tried to contact them and they got no response. And the Silver Star decided, okay, we're going. Our crew is going to go on. Can you imagine the first person to be like, you step on the boat. Exactly. No, you step on the boat. <laughs> and then just like f- fly your boat away. Fly your boat away. Okay. <laughs> you know, drive it off. Help. Okay. Um, la, la, la. So the. SOS is what I meant. It autocorrected to die, though. Um, <laughs> it so usually does. The ship d- didn't look like it had been taken over, so they're going to go check it out. And when they got on board, um, well, this is, so I'm going to talk about this guy later, but a guy named S.H. Mark, he wrote a letter about what happened. And what the crew saw ha- has been described in the letter, and this is, this is an excerpt from that. There wasn't a living creature on the ship. The captain lay dead on the bridge. The bodies of the other officers sprawled in the wheelhouse, chart room, and wardroom. I don't know what the wardroom is. Um, The faithful Sparks was slumped in his chair in the radio shack, his hand still on the sending key. So, like, he was the one who had been typing, (gasps) I die. And his hand was still on the Morse code machine. Going for the D, I I die. Or or the T, maybe he was on a diet. A diet. I diet very well. Atkins, you know. Uh... (laughs) keto um let me see oh yeah his hand's still on the sending key the bodies of the crew lay everywhere in their rooms in the passageways on the decks and on all the dead faces was a look of convulsive horror (gasps) the frozen faces were upturned to the sun the mouths were gaping open and the eyes staring and a lot of the people were also pointing at something oh my god another source oh maybe this is where i say that another source says quote Every corpse's eyes were bulging. Oh. All of their mouths were open as if they were screaming and their hands were reaching out as if they were fighting at something um, or pointing at someone. Oh, my God. Ew, I have goose cam. Hmm. Yikes. So twenty, there were 22 shipmates in total and they were all dead and all in similar ways, including the radio operator. Um, and, quote, I'm sorry, even the ship's dog, a small terrier, was lifeless, its teeth barred in anger or agony as if it were snarling at something. So, like, everyone is kind of just, like, frozen in this oh, moment and dying. Um, poor baby. No, there was no sign of a cause of death. There were no wounds or injuries on the bodies. The ship had no damage, although there was one lifeboat missing, but there's mm-hmm. no way of really knowing if they went out without an extra lifeboat. Like oh, sure. They, like, if that was their... If it was there before. Not, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Weird. Um, and the crew also said that the bodies seemed to be um, decaying eerily quickly. <gasps> like, for, like, the one guy to have sent I die to be dead only a couple hours later, all of them were decaying and looking like they 
Ew. It wasn't only a couple hours. Um, also, the ship was 40 degrees on a hot summer day, and the boiler was on and working. So 40 degrees Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit to Fahrenheit. It was like what? fucking cold on this boat, and it was a summer day, and the boiler was on. There was no reason it should Which be. Which BTW, if they're decaying extra fast, it shouldn't yeah. be that cold. Like, that wouldn't make sense. That's a great point. Thanks. I'm full of them. Not, <laughs> not really. You're basically the next Marishka. Um, <laughs> oh, God, I wish. So uh, Silver, I the wish Silver Star's have. captain decided to tow the boat to port. They were like, we got to at least bring it back so we can investigate. And as soon as they tied it up and started going, all of a sudden, the Oorang Madan, um, there was smoke and fire that billowed out from one of the cargo holds. Oh, no. And the, it, the, it immediately basically caught on fire. And it was so, the fire was so intense and so hot and just blew the whole thing up so quickly that to save their own boat, the captain was like, okay, cut the tow line. Like, whoever's on there, we just can't even save them. Bye. Like, if there was someone on there who we could save, we can't do it. We just got to cut the tow and let the boat sink. Yeah. Wow. Um, And so when they cut the line, something in the cargo holds exploded, and apparently the boat even lifted out of the water at one point. It, like, it got <gasps> pushed out of the water so powerfully that it landed back in the water and started sinking, and you never what? saw the ship again the hell is going on here um so then uh you know there were some articles that came out about the story one in mart on march 13th and one on october 3rd both in 1948 um which is interesting because those are the next year oh okay um it is weird so there was one article in a Dutch Indonesian newspaper called The Locomotive. There was another in the San Francisco Examiner, and the article was called Secrets of the Sea. Ooh. And there was this little, I don't know if it was meant to be poetic, but uh, it, the, basically the Secrets of the Sea article started with, what ship? No ship. The Oorang Madan has vanished. <sighs> so... A little flowery there, which I enjoy. Love it. And some of the articles said that, so this is where it gets um, kind of conspiracy or at least the first, like, maybe not a red flag, but like an orange flag um, <laughs> that uh, about like how this is, what's odd about it is that there are so many uh, differing opinions on when this incident happened. Like, date wise, there are, are like, some say it was in 47, some say it was 48, some say it was 49, some say it was 1940, like seven years before. Oh, wow. Um, like nobody really knows the official time. Um, there are British articles from the Yorkshire Evening Post, the Daily Mirror, and the Hampshire Telegraph um, that all say that it happened in 1940. But then every other article says it's in the late 40s. It's weird. Yeah, that is weird. So there's like... and. It's like, why can't you just check like a, like a ship's records or a log or something from like the, the Silver Star? So. Yeah, the people who received the message. <clears throat> but um, so this is the Yorkshire Evening Post article. Explosions were repeated. Soon nothing was left of the Oorang Madan but a blazing hulk. The next day the fire burned itself out and the steamer went under, her secret with her. Mm. The Oorang Madan has sent out an, OS, an SOS, an OSO. Stupid. See, autocorrect it happens and, all the time. <laughs> my own brain autocorrected that one. Uh, an SOS and the message. Uh, send Dr. Urgent. Oh, this is why I was like, why did I put this in here? But okay. Um, so just listen to this real quick. So they sent on an SOS and the message was send Dr. Urgent. The <gasps> SOS from the steamship Urang Madan begged ships with a shortwave wireless to get touch with a doctor <gasps> And because of our shortwave set, we relayed the call for help. Medical stations from Germany, Rome, and France replied. We informed the Urang Madan and asked to transmit her request. So it's like even the articles are kind of off on the storyline. Like yeah. a lot of them are um, – a lot of them also just paraphrase what the SOS thing was. They never mentioned the like I die or – Oh, so sure. It, because even articles were getting it wrong, it's like who do you trust? Who do you believe? Right. And it's weird that they would leave something out that's right. so like – Eerie. wild yeah. yeah 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 so uh the quote didn't mention the state of the crew members saying that like they were all already dead it paraphrased the sos uh message and it was saying like we have medical stations from these places it's like that's in right that wasn't in the original uh morse code message either so um basically this is what causes a theory because nobody really knows what happened and nobody even knows when it happened right um so now in the 50s, people are still trying to solve this. In 1953, there was an article called Death at Sea. In 1955, there was a guy named Morris Jessup who wrote a book called The Case of the UFO. 
And he thinks that it was an attack from aliens. I mean, listen, at this point, so do I. So (laughs) I mean, for it to be like, for them to be decaying quicker and for all of them to be like frozen in this like fearful moment. And the temperatures change and they're all pointing upward. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying it's aliens, but. I'm not saying it's aliens, but I'm not saying it's not aliens. Like that's I'm cer- it's still weird. I'm certainly saying it is aliens. So well, there you go. I'll go out on a limb and say that. Uh, and then in 1959, C.H. Mark, the guy who wrote um, that letter, who I s- said an excerpt about, um, he was thought to be the Coast Guard on watch that day. Um, this, so he should have, in theory, heard about it or seen yeah. it or something. And he ended up, um, even though this was 1959, so like a whole decade later, he finally decides to write a letter to the cia because he's con- oh, sure. <laughs> he's convinced something fucking wild happened yeah so he writes the cia and he had previously sent them another letter where he described what had happened like okay. what the mystery was and then he is now sending a follow-up uh letter I see. um and he he's kind of telling them his theory of what happened so he says i feel sure that the tragedy holds the answer to many of these airplane accidents and unsolved mysteries of the sea Also, I've often thought about the many sightings of huge fiery spheres rising from or disappearing into the sea, according to captains and crews in the 18th and 19th Mm -hmm. centuries. uh, There are alarming passages in old English chronicles written in medieval Latin or books printed before the year 1500, all of which suggest that these fiery spheres cause destruction and that they come from within our planet. (gasps) For instance, in 216 B.C., Quote, things like ships were seen in the sky over Italy and Sardinia as night's stick in his hand burst into flames. The same thing happened to Roman soldiers in Sicily who saw their javelins burn in their hands at RP. A round shield was seen in the sky. Also, uh, in the sea, a, a round shield was seen in the sky and several places. It also burned woods and plains. And it kind of ends with, yes, the enchanting sea. What terrifying secret does it hold? I feel sure that the SS Urang Madan tragedy holds that answer. So he kind of thinks like either there's some sort of like fire force, some supernatural thing caught like causing instant fires, which would explain why the ship exploded. Yeah. He thinks like people are seeing UFOs in the sky. It's been documented since like before Christ. A whole long time ago. So he's like something is going on out in the water. And I have a hunch that whatever that was also caused the the tragedy of the Uran wow. Um and uh the bu- 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 bu. where am I? Oh and so then the an assistant at the CIA actually wrote back and said an assistant they were like I guess this is my job. <laughs> and it, the assistant of the director of the CIA. Oh okay well that's so like well, kind pretty of like, high up there. Kind of the Dwight Schrute of the CIA um said Dear Mr. Mark, on behalf of Mr. Dulles, the director uh, may I acknowledge and thank you for your letter. Although we are unable to answer your questions, your letter is very interesting and we appreciate your concern. Sincerely, and then their name. Great. So it was vague, but also the CAA did take the letters that Mark had written and they deemed it top secret and didn't release it to the public yeah, until see, 2003. Something. See, there's something there. Because the CAA doesn't just like respond to every freaking yeah. letter it gets. Why would the assistant of the CAA... Right. Like, I mean, I'm sure let's put it this way. I worked at the prices, right? And I got a <laughs> <laughs> let's just stop there. That's let's just the, that makes the point pretty clear. I think I worked at the prices, right? And my job was to answer all the fan mail. And there was some weird I shit. Imagine. There was some weird fan mail. I didn't know how many people loved Drew Carey. Um, <laughs> the answer's a lot. Um, but a lot of them, there were a lot of people who I don't think were entirely stable who were writing because sure, sure, some sure. of them definitely thought that like Drew Carey and them had like a rapport going, oh my. which they didn't. Um, but a lot, there were some people who were like, I have like, you know, the price is right as a conspiracy. There, oh my gosh. There's some people who think that there's like some sort of theory that like the game shows are ran by the government to like get your financial information. What? Like, there's some wild stuff going on. And let me tell you, as the person who responded to fan mail, I did not respond to those because they were... You don't like, want to engage. Because I didn't want to engage. And also, they weren't, like, use. They weren't useful or onto something that I needed to, like, cover up. Sure. So, for, like, this CIA director's assistant to be flipping through all of the letters... And you can only imagine get, the CIA, what they get about the, aliens. Imagine the conspiracy shit that they get. And she picked this one to make a comment about. Mm-hmm. It kind of is eerie to me. Also, the fact that they made a top secret and they didn't release it until 2003, so like 50, 60 years later. That top secret thing is a little fishy. Weird. For lack of a better term. And for her to even say, like, 
we uh we can't discuss this or but mm-hmm. we we hear your concern like which by the way like super that's vague. just so rude and passive aggressive <laughs> but whatever but also i would like to take this moment to thank all of you for sending normal fan mail because i don't think yes. we've ever gotten fan mail saying that there's We're a conspiracy, conspiracy. <laughs> which like actually might be fun so it might be fun if you if you mean it ironically <laughs> yeah yeah maybe not in like a very real way but um uh, None of you have ever thought that this was a conspiracy, which means we're doing a good job tricking you. That's right. So, um, you cut that up, cut that part out. It's really <laughs> so, anyway, that's kind of the end of the mystery. There are a lot of theories. So, um, most of the theories have to do with the fact that they think this ship, especially because remember they weren't on the right normal course they were mm-hmm, on like mm-hmm. a random path mm-hmm. um and this was in the 40s at some point so they think this had to do with um world war ii uh-huh. and so they a lot of people speculate that this ship was probably smuggling in some chemicals <sighs> for nuclear warfare Wait, that's really interesting and we during world war ii like right. it was their job to smuggle in some stuff from like japan why they put uh, a dog and involve the dog in that uh, yeah thing. i don't know maybe he was the one smuggling it in and they, they were the uh the ones who had to cover up for the dog <laughs> so uh most of these theories kind of follow that storyline but they're different chemicals so theory one and kind of like theory one through like theory six or so is basically that in some way they were smuggling toxic poisonous chemicals and they ended up inhaling it or they there was a leak and they died um I wonder what this maybe they were yeah trying i'm trying to, to think like what or... causes instant rigor mortis as you're like not even entirely dead yet well as a chemist i certainly can't tell you as a chemist i cannot tell you wow it's top so favorite, i think i guess chemistry has failed us um or uh, aka i failed chemistry, failed chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> um, i think it's pretty clear which one's true so there's one marine historian named roy bainton and he thinks that the vessel Okay, yeah, was involved in smuggling hazardous cargo. Hazardous cargo. Excuse me. There's one guy named Professor Searsdorfer mm. who actually found the. He was uh, the founder of the German publication. Oh, I didn't get rid of it. I told Christine there was a, a German word that I won't be able to read, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I took it out of my notes. Nope, it's here. So he founded this German publication called Das Totenschiffen der Südsee. Oh my gosh. That's like the, Is that right? the dead ship. Wait, say again. Oh, the dead ship of the South Sea. Okay, good. Wow, I at least said it well enough for you. I, I understood it. Did I have the most American accent as I did oh, that? You sounded like okay. you Let's learned see. German at zero years old. Age Great. one. <laughs> um, okay, so basically he studied this case for decades. And he thinks that the most likely chemical could have been a combination of potassium cyanide and nitroglycerine. Mm. Um, and he thinks that they were in the ship's cargo hold and these sensitive materials, again, I already kind of paraphrase this, but um, during World War II, they might have been smuggled in and they were going to use them for some sort of experiments or some sort of chemical warfare. Um, I mean, that does make a lot of sense to me. Right? Yeah. That makes sense to me. <laughs> um so this would explain why the ship wasn't on the typical course and also how it just like maybe they inhaled it and then oh. it blew up. And it explains why the CIA would take it so seriously. Yeah. That it would be top secret. Listen, I'm on to you, CIA. You're not a chemist, but you are a historian. But I am a CIA C- special agent. Oh, shit. Eva, cut that out. Eva, you got it. Damn Come it. on now. I'm not very good at this. No. Oh, Write my God. Write me some fan mail. <laughs> like 200 episodes almost, and you have the nerve every we time. so close. Every time. And thank God Eva's deleted it every single time you've told them we're in the CIA. She better not forget she this not forget. one very time. I mean, come on. Because that, that would be real quite. Bad. That would not be cute. Woohoo! We're going to get a call from the CIA soon being like, uh-uh. Oh, uh, my phone's already one ringing. too many. Don't you worry. My Blackberry is on fire. <laughs> I like how in your fantasy CIA world, everyone's got a BlackBerry. <laughs> <laughs> just me, actually. Nobody oh, right. else does. Uh-huh. I just decided I needed a BlackBerry because I, I mean, want to play Brick Breaker every now and then. Certainly if someone found a BlackBerry in your junk drawer, they would not think, oh, 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 you're leaving it in plain sight like a classic CIA move. They would think, there's your shitty BlackBerry. They think, Christine's... You know what I use on, and when they were training me in the CIA? A Palm Pilot. Palm Pilot. <laughs> I knew it. See? I love... I still to this day kind of... I love a stylus. Would, I love a good love Palm a good Pilot. Stylus. I, uh, I actually was on this fun fact about me. I probably have said this before, but I was oh, actually on the... CIA? We know. <laughs> you're a chemist? Oh, I know. directors of the CIA. No. I... Um, <laughs> Do man, I was actually real. F- this is like two truths and a lie. Uh-huh. Most of them are lies. Um, 
85 truth 85 lies and maybe one truth um, <laughs> maybe one truth <laughs> maybe maybe they're all just we'll lies. see uh, i was on the high score leaderboard uh for brick breaker in um in the midwest and that one's true because she's it never stopped fucking talking about yeah, it. yeah no, it's true and i had to pretend i was 18 to like get on the leaderboard good for you thank you very much good for that's you that's how i got it that's what i put it on my resume for the- oh shit special <sighs> secret oh God, skills good. you know what's uh when I was uh, in college, I had the best two truths and a lie because they were all like, I'm a ghost hunter and a clown. And a, and I like make pickles for I like fun. fucking ride segways for fun and shit. Yeah, yeah. it was. I loved. Ev- and Like how you say like back then, you're like, it's still relevant. Back in the Dizay. Well, also like, uh, especially like sorority fraternity shit when we had to do like icebreakers. Ice and everyone would like, it would get to me and everyone would start awkwardly giggling because they had heard me do the two truths and a lie oh when they were newcomers and it's was always every time i'd pick the most random shit and it was like all it was truth. Like, so it was three truths they no were all tr- <laughs> that's the wildest part that was like all i wanted as a child i was like i just want to blow people's minds with my elevator pitch about myself so yeah this it worked three hour podcast is a great elevator pitch <laughs> if you're stuck in an elevator we're still talking sure is. We're still talking about ourselves <laughs> Somehow, even during a pandemic, and we are extremely busy. I don't know how it happens. I don't but either. It's true. I, <laughs> either I'm doing nothing or everything, it's, but it seems like most days I'm doing everything. Suddenly, our calendar is like packed with things and phone calls and recordings. How and did this happen? Eva, amazing. what did you do? Eva, what happened? Um, thank God we have Daily Harvest, which we both love. Daily Harvest delivers delicious food built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. It takes just a few minutes to prepare. Like We never have to question, hey, is this healthy? What's in this? Um, always good stuff. No preservatives, no added sugar, no artificial ingredients. And Daily Harvest works directly with farm to freeze their ingredients at peak ripeness to uh, lock in nutrients and taste right into your mouth freezer and then mouth freezer freezer to mouth daily harvest farm to freezer to mouth uh, bingo that's our new slogan for you daily but harvest. not theirs just ours, just ours. For them. <laughs> and with daily harvest there's an option for any time of day so there's smoothies for breakfast there's also the flatbread we love the flatbreads which we can't it's a good stop lunch about. option and they have comfort food so for when the weather starts mm-hmm. to cool down and i love some i love anything hearty yes so they got some hearty options there they got some roasted harvest bowls and soups and again i've said this before but my apartment has a range of people and we all have something that we you love pick your favorites the second that the daily harvest gets to our door yeah you call it yeah we have we have a sharpie ready to like write our initials on each one we so we do claim that too. them yep so now blaze and i are the only ones so i just mostly eat all of them but <laughs> sometimes i'll let him in on on the good stuff um daily harvest is also committed to minimizing their environmental impact which is great they're in the process of transitioning to 100 percent recyclable plant-based and renewable fiber packaging so just Order away and you are not hurting anybody, especially Farm to freezer to mouth. yourself. Yeah. Farm to freezer to mouth. Daily Harvest makes it easy to eat clean, undeniably delicious food, no matter what your day brings. Keep it simple with Daily Harvest. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code drink to get $25 off your first box. That is promo code drink for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Dailyharvest.com. Harvest.com. I think you should be really proud of me, Em. Every day I am. Yes, because Policy Genius saves their home and auto customers an average of $1,127 a year by shopping top rated insurers in one place. And when I used Policy Genius, they were like, you did a good job. You are uh, getting the best deal possible on your insurance. Bravo. I felt like Policy Genius gave me like a pat on the back. And it, I was so it was thankful. Like a proud, a proud papa. Yeah, proud papa. Uh, and then I didn't have to <laughs> change. Papa my... policy genius. <laughs> well, it's a proud papa policy genius. Um, I if I know that a thousand one thousand one hundred twenty seven dollars is very specific, a little bit weirdly specific. I love a good weirdly specific thing. That's what it. we do here. Um, but they did crunch the numbers, and that's literally the exact average uh, a year that they they help save. And in fact, crunching numbers is one of the things Policy Genius does best. Their insurance marketplace makes it easy to compare rates from the top home and auto insurance companies to find you the best price. And uh, all you'd have to do is head to policygenius.com and a papa policy. I'm just kidding. Policygenius.com and answer a few quick questions about yourself and your property. You know Chris, how much I, love I was going to say. <laughs> 
I know you love a good quiz. I immediately quiz. took my quiz and I was like, I'll tell you all about my driving <laughs> habits, etc. cetera. Um, and then Policy Genius does all the work. They compare your existing policy against others in the market. Like they, it's just like happening all on your computer screen. You don't have to do the work. And then if Policy Genius finds a better rate than what you're paying, they'll get you switched for free. So like say that I try it again and they're like, actually, there's a better plan for you now that you've moved, then uh, they will switch it for me. I don't even have to do it. Bingo. It's really a great, great situation. So if you're a homeowner, head to policygenius.com right now to get started. They've saved their home and auto insurance customers an average, again, of $1,127 a year. Who knows what weirdly specific amount they could save for you? Um, that's policygenius.com. Um, okay, so yeah, potassium cyanide and nitroglycerin is the most likely yeah, chemical I combination. I agree with that. Uh, oh, good. Well, the chemist says it, so must be true. Um, the next one is... Uh, Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, so the guy who made that publication, Das Toten, <laughs> um, that one, that one uh, says that he spoke to a former shipmate from that boat, even though everyone was dead. Mm -hmm. So it says that he spoke to allegedly the sole survivor mm -hmm. um, named Otto Milke. Milke? Um, and he said that he took the lifeboat. Oh, the missing raft. So he says he's the sole survivor. Um, and basically he said that they were on their correct route and it was suggested that there were lethal substances in the cargo. Um, but then that leads to the question like, okay, was he the person who escaped the lifeboat? Like, is he lying or not? Like he could yeah, easily just I mean, like, all this information was in the papers. Anyone could say like they, a missing lifeboat. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, I also know Drew Carey is probably what he said. We're best friends. You know what? I, I still think about Drew Carey. Um, he, the day I left, he gave me a glow in the dark toilet seat. Sorry, what? And I, I lost it. Okay, I've never been so angry at you in my entire life. I'm also so fucking mad. I wanted him to sign it and everything. It, I didn't. He didn't get to sign it because I fucking lost it. What if this was like the lie? You were like something was true. It, no, the truth, the the lie would be that I have a glow in the dark toilet seat from Drew Carey after working on the prizes. Oh, right. that hurts my soul. But he gave it to me on the last day because it was one of the like gifts that they had, and like they like I think I don't know if they do it anymore, but they were like cleaning out their gift area inventory, and they were like, I don't think anyone's ever gonna want this, except for I know the exact person who wants this. Me. Their name is Emma Schultz. Um, but yeah, so. Wow, I'm so mad that you lost it. We were like, it. we're not going to use it because I think it was broken in some way. And I was like, I can just glue that shit back together. I don't care. I can't believe that. Why yeah. did you lose it? This is I a lost it on the lot. On Forget this story. I lost it on the lot. Wow. Uh, I, also, I mean, I was not like good at my job on the price is right i lost things all the time it's like reading fan mail i so across then in the same studio lot like if you go behind like the the um i guess it's the stage like where they're like mm -hmm. they, they pull the doors out and there's a car there if you keep walking past that like the car that's hiding back there you end up on the set of the young and the restless and i oh hell didn't yeah. know where i was going so i got lost on the set of young and the restless You're like i'm time. so young and restless i was like i'm just trying to get back to the restaurant help why are we talking about that again i literally have no idea Oh, because you were saying that he talks this about This guy how, probably says he's best friends with Drew Carey. He's, he's, he's well, because Drew Carey talks about lifeboats. And I was thinking about the time when I first moved to L.A. and I didn't know how crazy L.A. traffic was. I got into like three fucking car accidents all in one week. It's true. I was there. And I mean, I was a You know witness. who fucking commented on my shitty broken car every time he saw me pull into the lot was Drew Carey. Oh, my. And he's like, you would like this broken toilet seat. He was like, you like broken things. Well, no, he, uh, he saw me... The only way I could get into my car is if I climbed through the passenger seat because my door was so fucked up. Oh, dear up. God, Em. And so he used to watch me, like, <laughs> go to work and I had to, like, pull myself, like, through the passenger seat. Anyway, he always had something to say about it. So I just remember. And he would show up on, like, a motorcycle and, like, look all fucking cool. And he'd be like, nice car. And, and he's like, like, now go respond to all you. my fan mail. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed like just Also, the here's a fucking toilet seat for your one. troubles. Um... Anyway. Uh, but yeah, so back to the lifeboat. Yeah, we don't know if this guy was telling the truth. And also there's a whole other person who claims that he was the sole survivor. See, so then it's like, okay, someone's lying. Maybe both. Phony. Um, and if the crew died from chemicals on the ship, the other real question is like, then why didn't like the Silver Star crew also mm. at least feel ill by the time they got there? But I guess Maybe if had you're... had evaporated by that point? Yeah, I guess the, the argument could be if you're on a ship in the open waters, it could air itself out at yeah. some point. Yeah. Um, 
But so another theory is instead of it being potassium cyanide nitroglycerine, it could be um, sulfuric acid um, because this other sole survivor, he claims that they were carrying sulfuric acid um, from China to Costa Rica and they were intentionally avoiding the authorities. So that's why they were on a different path. Oh, um, that makes sense. So an, another chemical they think is called Talbin. I don't know what Talbin is, Me but neither. apparently it is a toxic nerve agent that's mass produced oh. by the, or was mass produced by the um, Germans in World War II. Oh dear. And they shared it with their Japanese allies. Um, they think that uh, Talbin has a low persistence level, whatever that means. And so it would have dispersed by the time the Silver Star crew got there. I see. Um, they oh, also... Yeah, ew, maybe that nerve... It's like a nerve response. Maybe that's that why everyone with that bodies sounds like, was messed up. No offense, but that sounds like some German shit from World War II. Oh, <laughs> wholeheartedly. Sounds not good. Um, oh, God. Another theory is that the ship may have had cargo for um, specifically the Japanese military unit 731. Did you say no offense? Like, I was going to be like, like you know, I was Germans. Like, no f- you know German. No offense. But you. I don't know. I know you're German, but do you know, like, World War II? Do you know how things Do you know the down history of any of that? Um, so I'm not offended to be clear. <laughs> uh, so the another theory is that the ship uh, was holding cargo from Japanese military unit seven three one because that unit specifically was known for chemical and biological experiments in World War Two, oh. and so that could have leaked on board, and that could also explain why everyone died in such a weird way because it was like this new thing that, um like that this one military unit was experimenting with. So it could explain like why all of a sudden they were like frozen like that or freaked out or why they looked scared. Like maybe they were hallucinating from it. Oh, that's a good point. And they thought that something really scary was going on. Huh. Um, Because even the dog, like he was frozen snarling. Like like they were all seeing something. So if it was some sort of experiment that they wanted to fuck with chemically, they could have been trying to do some sort of experiment where it was a hallucinogen. That yeah, you know, um, yikes! Though another theory uh, by this guy Vincent Gaddis, who fun fact coined the term Bermuda Triangle. Oh, uh, he thinks it was just simple carbon monoxide from fumes from the faulty boiler, um, which also leads to hallucinations sure. often. So, but it's like if you're all, it's like I'd, I've never done drugs, but I would imagine if you're all taking the same drug, you still all have a separate high. Like, Probably. not everyone's seeing the exact same thing. I also thing. have never done drugs, so I'm not the person to ask. <laughs> so, but, but maybe like, it is like if one person is like, everybody look, and oh, maybe yeah. it like and influences. Not the dog, though. I mean, dog unless the dog just... Like, the dog was the one that was like, holy shit, look at that. And then they were all freaked out because they heard a talking dog. It could actually... I know. That explains it. Yep. Are you sure you haven't done drugs before? It sounds like you're... I expert. actually was a dog once, but that's Oh, that's... It. Oh, shit. Um, so theory number six is that it honestly could have just been a total hoax um, because so many papers have differing reports throughout the years, especially on the event's dates. And there's so many theories of the chemicals on board. Why didn't the Silver Star crew mention a single chemical or a single, you know, stash yeah. of them or um, shady cargo that clearly authorities would want to avoid why was none of that mentioned in one of their logs like no matter what the chemical was there was if there was really something hazardous down there they would have mentioned it and that much of it yeah and that much of it to kill everybody um Mm. so and unless it was was like hidden i was gonna say maybe it was like in like vials or something well the boxes could literally just say like flour and like oh no there's like and they're not gonna say like uranium you sound like you have smuggled drugs before, Christine. Listen, um, I have not. <laughs> theory seven is that this entire story not just is a hoax, but is like completely like even the ship itself never fucking it's just existed. Like made up story. They're yeah, saying, oh. they're saying that the SS Urang Madan may have not I don't even like existed. That theory because there's no official incident report, like I mentioned, and mm. there's no official SS Urang Madan registration records for any country, including the Netherlands, where it originally started from or where it was built. What? Um. Even Lloyd's shipping registers, which I guess is like the universal oh. registration company. Um, the Even the Silver Star's daily logs aren't entirely accurate. And this is something that <laughs> I feel like our names will be listed in one day. Uh-oh. The Dictionary of Disasters. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, no. Apparently they have, it's called the Dictionary of Disasters at Sea, which I guess is just a total log of every single type of That's wreck. That's awful. Um it's from from 1824 to 1962 which in theory is when this happened there's no mention of that ship ever not one time like not even in another accident 
Really? So all of these like really trusted sources ha- and like official legal registration papers, none of them exist. And you would report that. Right. And <laughs> granted it was the 40s, so there wasn't anything digital. Like you could just like have, it could go missing and there's no other copy like or something. Like it's all but, they've written down, yeah. Um, well, especially then, if like it was a real wartime thing. Right. It could have been covered up or like. Right. The, I mean, also if the CAA knows about exactly it and was helping. It, like, yeah. It could have been called SS Christine. So, well, well, I already have a killer car named after me. So let's not. Okay, you're right. Let's not spread my name too far. Uh, Theory eight is that this honestly could just be a ghost ship. um, And that like it's uh, maritime folklore. And that a lot of people say like maybe if you see the ship, you're seeing the SS Urang Badan. Or Hmm. uh, because the crew looked scared and there were eerie temperature changes on board, they think literally ghosts could have done this. Like like showed up. Any any potential Murdered everybody? It seems a little strange. And the ship has never been found. And like I said, the dates and the the information on it are so different. It could have just turned into this folklore situation Mm -hmm. where... They blame ghosts for this mystery that happened. Mm -hmm. Um, Theory nine is your favorite, which is aliens. Oh, for sure. Um, For sure, for sure, for sure. It's just due to the lack of a natural cause of their death and the terrified expressions on their faces and the rumors that some of them are pointing to something. um, And the CIA involvement. And the CIA involvement. And the fact that in 1955, that guy Morris Jessup wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. Um, It just all kind of suggests that maybe they were attacked by a UFO. I'm sure the History Channel has something to say about that. Probably. (laughs) Um, and then theory 10 is that it was, this is one's just fucking stupid, but the, <laughs> the, it was just a mariner, uh, bad luck, like a curse because the Udon, the Urang Madan is a masculine name and uh-huh. it is like maritime tradition uh-huh. that you name your ship a female name because all ships are women. <sighs> so they think that it was just, oh, because you named it something different you're you you misgendered you this for it you misgendered this boat. you misgendered your ship and so it murdered everybody listen if i were a ship never mind. Say. <laughs> um okay <laughs> so theory 11 is and this is the final one is that the letter exchanged between the cia and that guy begs the question did the cia actually have something to do with this why would they write back at all considering there's so many like fake theories yeah. that get sent to them all the but time. Why would they reach is, out to this? If it were real, why would they even respond? And why would they deem a random letter top secret? Like, no, but what I'm saying is like, why, if it were real and they were like, shit, this is top secret, why would they respond? I feel like that just creates right. a paper trail where it's like, right. If anything, that would be the one you definitely. Exactly. Ignore. That's a good point too. I don't know, man. <clears throat> so some people think the SS Urang Madan uh, involved, was involved in a government experiment and like, People wonder, like, what about this case? Did the CIA know that Mm -hmm. deemed this thing top secret? Or, like, did they... Maybe it wasn't even that this ship did anything particularly weird, but it could just be, like, that the the cargo on it was CIA protected. Or maybe there was another ship out there where something similar happened, and because this was, like, Ah. adjacent or uh, relevant in some way, maybe they just wanted to cover all their... This could just be, like, a weird outlier, but it was similar to something they are involved in, so they wanted to take cover that up just in case because that would explain like this doesn't sound like it's something the cia would like really be too worried about except for the fact that there was a chemical during world war ii yeah and maybe there were a bunch of ships like that and so they just shut down all the stories about any of the ships my thought is because the guy who wrote to the cia was the like head of the coast guard right yeah so i mean that makes sense why the cia would respond to be like he was the coast guard on watch that day okay because i feel like that's like an important position so i guess I could understand why the CIA would be like, we should acknowledge that this person wrote to us because he's... Yeah, a government official. A, an important... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So maybe that's why they wrote back. I don't know. That's but weird. it's weird. It's It makes it very weird that they mm-hmm. wrote back at all and deemed a top secret. Um, but yeah, so that's it. Basically, the... Other than that, there's a fun fact where the Urang Madan inspired a video game called Man of Madan. Uh, and here's the little blurb about it. Five individuals partaking in an underwater di- uh, diving who are, partic- who are partaking in underwater diving um, are brought against their will to a large ghost ship, the fabled Indonesian Urang Madan, oh dear. where their worst nightmares become reality. With their safety threatened, their sanity tested, and their survival at stake, the five must make swift life or death choices that could either lead them to freedom or cause them to suffer fatal consequences. Oh, no. So if you liked this story and you like video games and that sounded fun to you, you can go buy Man of Madonna. <laughs> that sounds enjoyable to you. <laughs> Check anyway, it out. That is the, that's the story. That's one of my favorites you've covered in a long time. Really? Yeah. 
Why? I just love like conspiracy theory. I just think that's so fascinating. And also, I think I was hooked from the second you said this letter, this Morse code message. That one that hooked me. I too. like the second I saw whew. that Morse code message. I went, oh yeah, that that's sounded a twist. like one of my creepy unsolved, you know, crime cases. Like yeah, ugh, so wild. I die. I mean, that is spooky yeah it was like everyone, chilling and then the fact that they then f- like went on board and found the guy who clearly sent the morse code in his hand was still on the morse code thing yeah on the machine yeah how creepy <clears throat> super creepy it's just such a mystery i don't know i really like that story because it could be so many different things yeah um also i'm realizing now the way that the german word was it probably meant like the ghost ship mm. like, you know it's a debt how do you say like, ghost and poltergeist is that how you say ghost and yeah geist geist yeah what's polter prank god it is something like that, yeah. Turkey it's, trickster ghost. I thought you said turkey. I was like, I'm sure it's Ooh, not turkey ghost. Oh, poultry, maybe oh poultry, poultry ghost, poultry geist. <laughs> okay, let's say a that chicken one for, ghost. Say that one for Thanksgiving. A Eva. chicken nugget. Okay. Um, I think it is. I literally have looked this up like ten times. I think it is something pranky ghost, fun ghost, play ghost. Shit, I need to. I need to look wow, you're my German's fought Krizap. I guess German wasn't your first language either. I guess I don't really speak any language because, like, listen to me for a minute and you'll <laughs> understand. Um, okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is a story I'm very excited to tell you. Okay, okay. Um, this is one that I did not know at all until, like, I don't know if it was episode five or it was like really early where, or maybe it was on where Deirdre was on. I'm not sure, but you brought it up. And I was like, oh, what's that? And then you told me like a quick blurb and I went, what? Oh, Deirdre? So I know it. You do know it? Yeah. Well, you said Deirdre. I don't know if Deirdre has any connection to this. I really don't. Lorraine about it. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to make you guess based on this little interview section, but you already guessed it. Deir- uh, she babysat Deirdre. I was telling Eva, I was like, somebody babysat somebody and I don't yeah, know that who was... babysat whom. Of course it was Deirdre's babysitter. No. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was yeah. Uh, so... So Lorena Bobbitt, uh, yes, I'm very excited about this one because I actually know this one. I know. I know all the locations you're going to talk That's about. That's what I'm saying. I was like, and Eva was excited about this one too. So I was like, this is like a double. Oh yeah, Eva would know even better. because A double whammy. Eva lived closer to where this all happened, I think. Well, that's why, remember last night when Eva was like, where was I talking about Manassas? I was like, oh, that was this, this was in Manassas? Yep. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like not great sorry, things happen there. Sorry to all the people who live in Manassas, but like every single person that I seem to meet has like one enemy from Manassas. Yeah, I mean, the including fact, me, I have an, an enemy you. from Manassas. Exactly. The I, fact also have that, a, I also have a best friend from Manassas just to like to, to cater to the, the nice people. Here. I do have a best friend named Ellen uh, who lives in Manassas. Well, but. I will say any town that has the word manass in it doesn't seem like it's going to end They're well. called the Manassholes. That's well, their thing. So are Massholes though. So yeah, I mean, it's not too original once you find enough places with the word ass in it. But uh, yes, Deirdre's, uh, so Lorena Bobbitt was kind of her babysitter um, in that like she did babysit Deirdre and Deirdre's brothers a few times, but the way that they knew each other was because Deirdre's normal babysitter and Lorena Bobbitt lived together. They were roommates. Oh. And so every, and then Deirdre was like, oh, she was always really nice to us. And, you know, sometimes when like our normal, like nanny. She wanted the Castros. <clears throat> What's that? Was she a Castro? That's the family she like lived with. Maybe. That would be weird. That would be weird. I don't know the name, but I know that Deirdre always said like in times where, like our nanny, like last minute couldn't watch us. Like we like Lorena would just be there because she already knew us and she was really nice. See, and I remember going, I don't know that story. And you guys were like, um, hello. Everyone in Virginia knows Lorena Bobbitt. Yeah. And so, and then I said to Eva, like, I also don't really know the story. And she was like, what? And I was like, I think more Virginians know this yeah. than it's a, it's a classic. It's, we don't get a lot of fun, true crime in Virginia, but this is certainly this is, one uh, of them. I gotta say, if you don't know what, <clears throat> by the way, I'm, I apologize. If you don't know what this is, I don't apologize because you're about to get a great twist of a story. It's a fun one. Okay. This uh, is the story of Lorena Bobbitt. Yes. aka Deirdre's babysitter so <laughs> i by the way now that you know who Deirdre is of course her fucking baby well i know that's why <laughs> that's why i just was like i know you mentioned it and i was like i'm sure Deirdre was involved but i don't know how, how... <laughs> she's involved in a lot of weird things that happen in she's virginia she's involved in actually i'm pretty sure every weird thing that happens in virginia, uh-huh. from what i know of her yeah. um so this is actually the little little blurb that i was gonna say like can you guess what this is based on this so i'm okay. just gonna read it anyway interviewer what was your reaction when you found out what happened to your brother? Brother, if I'd have seen her, I would have killed her. <gasps> Interviewer, you think she tried to kill him? 
brother. She tried to hurt him in the worst way possible for any man. She did worse than kill him. She took the thing that means the most to a man. And that was from the Jenny Jones show um, featuring John Wayne Baba and his two brothers, Todd and Brett. Um, and so I, that was like the little intro, like, do you know what this is? For those you probably would have figured it out. For those of you who are wondering what that means, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to wait long because I'm going to start pretty much right in the right thick of it. Right on spot, yep. June 23rd, 1993, Manassas, Virginia, um, small town, 30 miles outside of Washington, D.C., where everybody has enemies, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and around. <laughs> There's always just one person from Manassas where you're just kind of like, ugh. ugh. Okay. I'm sure Manassas is wonderful. I guess I know one now, too, from the story. So. Uh-huh. Well, the people for, in Manassas, I will say, I did take uh, the first time all three of us. Uh, oh, that's right. We all went to D.C. together. Oh, I took I them did. to Nathan's uh, ice cream. I thought I'd been there, but then I was like, why would I have ever been there? But so you took me good. there. Yeah, Nathan's has like... Great, the, so her, I was like, I fucking hate that place here. But I love Nathan's, and I've been to the movie theater next to it many times. It's a great... It's a wonderful place. Wonderful. Well, it wasn't on June 23rd, 1993. Okay. 3.15 a.m. after a night out drinking and hanging out with his friend Robert Johnston, uh, who was staying with him, 26-year-old John, which is, I didn't realize how young he was, 26-year-old John Bobbitt goes to join his wife, 24-year-old Lorena, in bed. He slams the bedroom door, which wakes up Lorena, and goes to sleep. John claims that she began, quote, playing around with him, Mm -hmm. and then she put her arms around him as he was falling asleep, and suddenly he felt a pull and a jerk. Mm. He wakes up and sees blood everywhere. Lorena quickly disappears. And in his kind of fatigue, he realizes that she has disappeared with his penis. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. I wish I could see anybody who doesn't know the story yet. I was, I was going to say, that's nuts. But his nuts are still intact. <laughs> Those are still there. And there are plenty of That's photos. That's wieners. Have you seen the photos? Yeah. There are many. There are many. Yeah. And wow, is it grotesque. Yeah. It's actually pretty. Like, I was not as horrified as I thought I'd be. I was like, oh. It's just kind of what you imagine it would look it's like. It's like exactly what you're picturing. Yeah. Um, so there's blood everywhere. Uh, his wife, Lorena, has boop, chopped off his dick. <laughs> um yeah for lack of a better more uh subtle term it's noodles it's pretty noodle one noodle bananas sure listen it could be a lot of phallic things going on here i don't know he's not peeling very well though <laughs> don't you dare bring my favorite joke into this please <laughs> so john wayne bob it finds robbie uh his friend to wake him up and help him robbie is also tired and not thinking straight by the way like pretty sure they're both wasted but that's besides the point uh-huh. um apparently robbie decides he has to go brush his teeth first uh <laughs> can you imagine if you were like help someone cut my boobs off and i'm like let me go let me my pee breath first. is so I bad can't though take this. hang on i mean you actually might do that because you really are concerned like, with your I'll, teeth brushing i'll be there in a second get in the car i'll come back i'll just calm yourself <laughs> I almost said calm your tits, and then I was like, wow, that really would have been a rude thing to say to me if I just lost them. Okay, anyway, so <laughs> sorry. we're literally like, shit, don't you dare. Thank God. <gasps> You're making everybody that so was nervous so behind tough. the scenes. <laughs> For those of you who are just listening and not watching, I had my mouth impossibly full with water. <laughs> Good. Could not have wanted to gag more in that second. Okay, <laughs> we're good. We are at four bullet points in, so this might be buckle up, everybody. Okay, <laughs> so he decides to go brush his teeth. And then he's like, I'm going to rush my bleeding, literally amputated friend to the hospital. So the hospital uh, takes in uh, John Wayne Bobbitt. And at first, apparently, the nurse was like, what happened to your hand? Because he was like Correct. holding his hand and it was so bloody. And then he removed his hand and they went, oh, dear. So they want to perform surgery on him, but they obviously cannot put the penis back on without having the actual penis. Right. Um, so doctors are like, we're going to have to restructure the, or reconstruct the area. Um, <clears throat> the surgeon who was interviewed in the, doc- the documentary Lorena on Amazon Prime, which I'm going to talk about more. Um, it's a great, great documentary. Um, anyway, the surgeon who was interviewed was basically like uh yeah we were gonna have to surgically reconstruct it so he would have to spend the rest of his life peeing sitting down like a woman and i was like okay cool there's nothing wrong with sitting down and peeing like a woman it's actually much more relaxing that's the worst yeah Yeah, i know (laughs) okay so the police received calls around uh 5 a.m um originally the sergeant jerry hawks had thought that uh lorena may have swallowed the penis which is 
That was a rumor All throughout of them town. thought that that, <laughs> that was, was like a rumor. Everyone's first gut instinct was like gobbled it down. She must have eaten it, which I'm like, what? Why? <laughs> what is in your brain that you're like, that's where it went? Um, but they order crime scene technician Cindy Leo to Maplewood Apartments um, to try and find the penis. When Cindy arrives, she notices blood spots on the stairs up to their apartment. There's also a pool of blood on the bed, which is approximately Ooh. one inch deep. Wow. That's how much blood there was. was Holy cool. shit. He actually lost a third of his <gasps> blood volume. Yeah, it was really, really, well, really. I mean, that sucks, but also like, sorry, that sucks, but also like fun fact of like, if you were to chop a penis off, that's how I much blood. It makes would, sense. Yeah. That that's where it would go, right? It just, I, I mean, it's g- good information. Yeah. Yeah. And bad information also. Yeah. So. Good trivia information. Yeah, that's true. Uh-huh. Um, so the crime scene technicians don't find the penis, uh, but they do as they're looking. So apparently he goes, of course we check the garbage disposal. And I was like. What is going on that everyone thinks she ate it or put it down the garbage disposal? Uh-huh. I guess. But and also they checked the dishwasher, like maybe she cleansed it. I don't know. So they checked the d- disposal. Interesting. They checked the dishwasher, are not finding this penis. Um, but while they're looking, they do find several pamphlets uh about rape and domestic violence. Uh-huh. Uh foreshadowing. Yep. Suddenly, the team at Maplewood Apartments receives a call from their lieutenant, um, and he is with Lorena at the police station. She is there to report domestic violence she's been suffering under John. The police calm her down and say, we'll get to that, but first, we need to know where your husband's penis is. Which is First things first. Yeah, which is basically the priorities of this entire case, summed up in one sentence. Which says a lot, too. So Lorena's pretty frazzled. She's, like, really out of it. Like, she's just hazy. And she, like, can't remember what she's done with this penis. And um, they're like, just think, like, what did you see? And she says, I remember a 7-Eleven. And I remember driving near the 7-Eleven. And she tossed it out her left side, but over the roof. So just like, whoop. She said she was driving and she realized she was holding it. And she couldn't drive very well because she was holding something. Right. Saw it, hurled out the window, and just kept going. Um, So it landed to the right of the car. Please go there immediately. They're like, the time's a ticking. This there, guy. I remember there. I think there was like a newscast of this or there was like news footage where like there were a cops all in a field looking for a penis. Yes, it <laughs> literally is so ridiculous. Actually, I have a photo we'll put in the YouTube video of um, the guy who found it standing there and pointing at the yeah, spot like, where he found it. You don't want to go like, I found it. Exactly. And yeah. Cid- Cindy actually like had to go back with the officer and be like, can you stand where it was so I could take a photo? Like, yeah. like she's a crime scene technician. And so he's like standing there pointing at it. It's yep. just so awkward. Um, so Sergeant Willard Hurley is the first to find uh, John's pain mm-hmm. in the grassy field outside the 7-Eleven, but he refused to get close to it. I think they said, like, he was religious, which I was like, what? Okay. Okay. So You're also a police officer? Right. It sounds like... I guess. Yeah. You're like, it'd be gay if I touched it. Yeah, it's but like, I also don't think he probably would have picked up a... That's true. A boob or a, a something that's else. That's true, but I immediately want to judge a uh, Virginian in the 90s. Oh, I'm for- fully judged. Oh, yeah. <laughs> don't worry. You'll have plenty of chances to judge literally okay, every excellent. man in this entire story. Um, so, oh, this story is rough. Okay. Okay. So now they have this penis and they, somebody goes and gets it because he refuses to. Um, so they bring it into a 7-Eleven. Do you know what they put it in? Oh, this is another trivia fun fact. Mountain Dew or something? What? They put it on ice in a big bite hot dog box. A hot dog box. I thought it was like a Mountain Dew Slurpee cup or something. No, it's like a hot dog container also no i don't think he literally they literally put it in like mountain dew to preserve it but i meant, like, I meant the bottle but yeah then i remembered how that might sound yeah no uh, uh hot, hot dog, dog box. box so that's kind of a fun little wink at the also, situation yeah a nod to the hot dogs so now with uh this iced penis in tow police call the hospital and the uh surgeon dr david berman and dr james sen the urologist prep john for surgery as they wait for the penis to arrive and then they show him he, they present it like a ring box yeah can you imagine being the person who worked in that 7-eleven by the way who was like i need a <gasps> box and they they were like are you gonna buy anything with that and they're like i need it for someone's they're like penis. actually no <laughs> actually maybe you should just close this whole location because you're about to get swarmed by <laughs> news cameras um so let's see so the police bring the penis to the hospital um apparently the, the nurse who was interviewed in this documentary said that like while he was going to surgery a lot of the officers were sitting with like their legs crossed in the waiting room because they were like in like phantom pain in, like yes exactly um she's like for us it wasn't a big deal but they were all like <laughs> squirming in their seats um, so while John was under in his nine hour, by the way, long surgery, 
uh, on one side of the hospital. Lorena was on the other side getting a rape kit taken, done. Um, she's interview being simultaneously interviewed by a detective. So she told the police uh, where they could find the knife. She didn't, like, try to hide anything. Uh, she said it was in a garbage can outside of the nail salon where she worked. And uh, she had driven there after the incident. And unfortunately, it was garbage day that day. So Cindy, ah. the crime scene technician, had to rush to the nail salon to find the knife before the garbage trucks took it away. Um, so the first words uh, he hears Dr. Berman say when he wakes up, when John wakes up, are, the operation was a success, but your penis could still turn black and fall off. <laughs> Just like, yikes. What a nightmare. A waking nightmare. Uh, luckily for John, the penis looked, quote, really terrific after the surgery. And Dr. Berman confirmed that he would regain virtually all of his normal functions. He even said, it turned pink right away. I was like, okay, now I don't want to know more. Excellent. I'd rather not. Rock on. Yikes. Okay, the following day, the story, not shockingly, became international news with everyone getting involved, um, ha like being everyone, probably even the 7-Eleven person, being hounded for interviews. <laughs> um, I can only imagine. Um, in the newspapers, journalists were struggling to describe what happened because no one knew whether they could, like, publish the word penis, uh -huh. if that was, like, too far, which... Yeah, probably a weird conversation in a lot of journalism, like, boardrooms. Yeah, like, how far can we go with this? Which, I think you can probably say the word penis, but I guess back then, that was yeah, back then, questionable. Before I don't people know. realized it's a human body it's part anatomy, and nothing right? else. <laughs> right. Um, so this same feeling coincided with how the police reacted, uh, on the morning of the event where they like refused to touch it. And, you know, it was just very, everyone was freaked out. Yeah. Um, when trying to radio each other, police officers were struggling how to describe the crime because they didn't know if they could say penis on the airwaves because the news media monitored the police airway, like monitored. Interesting. I don't know. The police that. radio system so that. If they said, like, hey, his penis was chopped off, like, can you imagine being, like, I'm just, like, doing a regular right, police scanner right. and you hear, like, if someone's penis was chopped off? I didn't know about that. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Uh, fun fact. So they often use the word appendage and organ. Yep. But it became an American cultural moment for uh, when the P word was used excessively in the media all of a sudden. Huh. Um, so John, who was still recovering from his injury, did bucket loads of interviews, like immediately. Um, and then Laura's friend and boss, Jana Bazzuti, uh, hired Lorena, an attorney, James Lowe, as well as a media representative, Alan Hogg. So the police, uh, they policed the media begging for interviews with Lorena, advised her like, lay low, don't jump into everything like John Wayne Bob it is. Right. I can't call him John. I want to call him John Wayne because it's just so ridiculous. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so, oh, I also wanted to add, I'm sorry, I meant to mention this earlier. I listened to an incredible two part episode on this, um, on the Sinisterhood podcast and I like love their show. I listen to it a lot and I never have like mentioned it cause, um, this is the first time I did like really used it for like real research and they did a, just a really great job. And they, the only reason I thought of that right now is that they talked about his name being John Wayne Bobbitt and apparently his brother's name is Todd. And they were like, why did they name one John Wayne and then the other one just Todd? Right. <laughs> I was like, that's a great question. Anyway, so uh, check out Sinisterhood. They do a great job on this story and a lot of other ones. Um, so uh, John was doing all these interviews. Uh, Lorena's lawyer was like, don't get involved. Lay low. The only interview Lorena gave was with Kim Masters from Vanity Fair, where the interview was accompanied by photos of Lorena in a swimsuit shot. Um and while Lorena was swimming around a pool for this photo shoot for Vanity Fair, the main question in the pu public's mind was, what would make a woman do this? Like, what possessed her to take this? Like, the penis cutter. Right, right, right. Yeah, like, what, what happened? Something pretty gnarly. I would imagine, like, if I found out that a woman chopped off a guy's dick, I'd be like, I don't know anything yet, but my first inclination is maybe he deserved it. Maybe something well, my, happened. Yeah, my first inclination <laughs> is what did he do? Like, yeah, right? like people don't just do that. Like, for fun? Something right. really bad must have happened to her from him. Oh, and it did. Just get ready. So. Do you know much about that background? Um, I know that he was cheating on her. Was he cheating on her and abusive? That's he was cheating on her. 
I don't know anything so, else. Oh boy. Get ready. Oh, I can't it's wait. It's really bad. It's really bad. Okay. Um, so Lorena and Gallo is her maiden name and John Wayne Bobbitt met at a dance hall near the Marine Corps base in Quantico in September of 1988. This now we're going the backstory here. Uh-huh. Lorena born in Ecuador in 1969 and raised in Venezuela first visited Washington DC in 1986 and she was 16 and fell in love with the US and decided she wanted to live there someday. She graduated from high school in 87 and moved um, on a student visa at age 18 in pursuit of her American dream, as she called it. She lived with family friends, the Castros. Mm-hmm. Um, that really might have been the family. That's that's who she lived with up until she lived with John Wayne Bobbitt. So probably. Maybe. Um, she lived with them uh, in Virginia and was always known for being pretty shy and quiet um, she was barely able to speak English, so she was taking classes in ESL. That's what Deirdre said. She was, I asked, like, I've asked, like, well, what's she like? And Deirdre said she was really friendly, but imagine, like, someone who, like, there was definitely a language barrier, Yeah. So they were just very quiet, but very kind. Yeah, especially right, right, yeah, yeah. that early into her living here. Yeah. Um, yeah, she didn't really know English. Um, and uh, so John himself was from Niagara Falls in New York, where he and his two brothers, who were three, uh, were placed in the care of his aunt and uncle, who were already raising four boys of their own, because John's mother apparently had a, quote, mental breakdown and had been suffering abuse herself. Um, in high school, he was extremely athletic. He thought of himself as uh, as a Jean-Claude Van Damme, a name which he'd used to sign into the local pool. He gave okay. himself a nickname, which... Great. Woof. Yikes. Um, so <clears throat> he went on to join the Marines. And uh, that night at the Marine Corps in 88, when they met, Lorena and John danced and exchanged phone numbers. And they say they fell in love with each other. Basically, at first sight, Lorena admired how much of an absolute gentleman he was. And he remembered how beautiful she was. And they pretty much began dating right away. But um, it was a very conservative, quote unquote, way of dating because she had been raised in a very conservative manner and so to her like you didn't just go they had chaperones the castro is literally like chaperone the dates because um that's just how she was raised sure so uh they start dating um and he's the first person she's ever dated uh, their dates were often chaperoned by the Castros, and 10 months in, they are at the swimming pool. There's a lot of pools in this story for some reason. They're at the pool, and he found – he dives to the bottom, and he finds, like, somebody had dropped, like, a gold ring with a bow on it at the bottom of the pool. And he comes up with it and proposes to her with that. <laughs> Romantic. Right? I'm like, ugh. Ew. Somebody dropped that in the bottom of the pool. Okay. It's just such a – it's just all bad so she said yes uh she said yes they married on june 18th 1989 and settled down in manassas virginia uh two years before this john had been discharged from the marines but struggled to find and hold down a job um neighbors even struggled when they were asked to remember him ever working so it seems like he really didn't have a history of you know uh a job history so lorena was pretty much all of a sudden expected to make all the money Mm -hmm. and pay for everything and she was a manicurist and made minimum wage right and you know was trying to wasn't wasn't cutting it like no yeah yeah. and like shouldn't have been expected to pay for both of their lives right lifestyles and rent etc um as lorena told abc news it was only a month into their marriage when john first hit her so here we spiral quickly down okay to the bottom of the pool Um, In Lorena's preliminary hearing in 1993, Detective Peter Weins read out the statement Lorena provided him at the hospital the first night of the incident, and I quote, And then I was angry already, and I turned my back, and I then the first thing I saw was the knife. Then I said, I asked him if he was satisfied with what he did, and he just half asleep or something. He always have orgasm, and he doesn't wait for me to have orgasm. He's selfish. I don't think it's fair. So I pulled back the shirt or the sheets. Then I did it. So she... Later regretted saying that because she said that wasn't what she was trying to say. Like, it was one of misled the, the. It made it sound like that was specifically why versus like that was one of many, many, many reasons why he was a piece of and shit. And she doesn't. <laughs> she was basically like, I don't even remember. Like, that's not. That wasn't right. the point. Right. Right. Um, but so that, of course, everyone like jumped on that. Um, and James Lowe, her defense attorney, said, that is not really what was being said there. You have the problem of a second language. Right. You have a problem with a woman who was hysterical at the time. 
Um, and also probably scared as shit being interviewed about this stuff. Fully. So like just saying whatever came to mind. And, and like didn't even worked. want to talk about it, but like had to um, in the do- documentary. She reflected how she couldn't quite comprehend what was even going on at the time when she gave that statement. And so that was something that that's not how she wished it had gone. Like, was that damning at all later in court? Oh, fully. Because, I mean, well, not in court, but just in the public gotcha. in general. Because I would think if she led with like, he beats the absolute shit out of me and like, I was scared or something. Right. It might have framed it differently. No, so it was framed. Like victimized her more or something. Well, well, I guess you'll see. <laughs> okay i'm not sure because you can make a like, you can decide i think for yourself like whether you think I'll i just mean give you the facts yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can decide so soon after the hearing um the first of two trials began there was a his and hers trial essentially uh, so john's assault trial with the charge of marital sexual abuse went first um and because this was a sexual abuse trial permission was denied to put it on tv uh however reporters uh flew in to document the case and um they didn't have anything to worry about as far as like finding enough footage because oh. the locals of Manassas were making sure people were not going home empty handed. They started making t-shirt souvenirs that read Manassas, Virginia, a cut above the rest. Ooh. And we're selling those as like tourist, you know, attractions. Um, over the course of November 8th to the 10th of 1993, both John and Lorena took the stand where they gave their own account of the events that night through the framing of sexual abuse. So the judge ruled that the jury were only allowed to consider acts of sexual abuse against Lorena on the night in question and only incidents within five days of Lorena's actions would be admissible. So basically they were like, this is not about their past. This is about that night and whether you find him guilty of this behavior that night and within the five day period. So things that might've occurred in their past. So like the history of their abuse was not to be considered or included. Um, and Lorena's act of severing her husband's genitals was also not supposed to be part of their Uh thinking, which I'm sure it was, but you know, um, thinking about this charge of marital sexual abuse. Um, so marital rape had only become a crime recently. It was in 1993 that it even became a crime because before that, I mean, Oh, once you're married, like you That's apparently immediately property. consent for the rest of eternity. Right. You don't get to say no. Right. Exactly. Um, so Carlos Sanchez, who's a journalist for The Washington Post, uh, reminded listeners that, quote, at this time in 1993, in order to convict on a spousal rape charge, which carried a life sentence, there were two conditions. You had to be separated from your spouse at the time of the crime. So even marital rape only counted if you were separated from the person. So it it just it, like, it was still like they as long as you have already said I don't want to be married with you anymore. I don't want to be with you. That's when it counts. Uh-huh. But it, if you're together and living under the same roof, like no no no. Yeah. Um secondarily there are two things you had to to prove. So secondarily you had to cause significant physical bodily damage. Fuck ah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's also like going back to the first one, like it's like so you can say no to being married anymore, but you can't say no to like having sex with that person. Mm hmm. So stupid. I I don't. It's just it's so fucking stupid. OK, correct. So sorry. And then also you have to like be like fucking bloodied up for someone to believe that oh, your fully your no even counted. And that was a problem for Lorena, too, because she was like not, you know bleeding or anything right she just said no and she she looked too healthy yeah she looked she looked There's, too sprightly that's actually for, to mean it like a quote i'm pretty sure pretty pretty oh, much fuck that off. is coming off uh pretty soon yep i think it's literally in this bullet um so leslie wolf from the women's policy study center concurs saying that quote we're still in a situation where people believe that a man's wife was his property that was just the yeah thinking process and i'm sure for a lot of people still is um on the stand although lorena would recount the stories of rape she was forced into along with how he had said to her that forced sex excited him which is he said that a lot uh the doctor who examined her said he couldn't find any outward physical signs of rape and that her mental state quote didn't fit the frame frame of mind of a victim Mm. i fucking hate this place (laughs) me too oh my god take me out take me away aliens please god (laughs) Okay, I'm just going <laughs> to jump ship literally onto a UFO. <laughs> Goodbye. Leave my husk behind. Leave these husks behind. There was also a whole thing about how the underwear she was wearing was I, torn. I don't even want to know. 
too late, too bad. Uh, forensic analyst, I have to know, you have to know. Uh, forensic analyst conducted an investigation saying the fabric was unable to be just ripped like that and found a tiny scissor cut. So she must have done it to plant it? Yeah. And John's oh defense went on to say, and where did she work? A nail salon where you'd find scissors. And I was like, and guess where you live? A house where, where you'd, you'd find, find scissors. scissors. Okay. It's really stunning, actually, how they just framed this whole thing. Also, like, I don't know if this she is- went to the hair salon or the nail. I'm sorry. The nail. She salon clearly went to cut to her, work, own, cut her uh, own underwear, then went home and then. Like, also, like, someone who's raping, you can just take your underwear off, and there's no cut at all, and it's still assault. But they're they're proving, they're trying to prove, quote unquote, that he didn't assault her at all, and that she's making it up. This is such bullshit. Of course it is. This is infuriating. Oh, it's the most vile. It just gets so so much worse, Em. I'm clearly, like, such, like, a... Uh, a sheep to this too and that like I literally grew up knowing the story my whole life and yeah. like you you hear uh, a girl cut his dick off and then like they, you don't that's like the most shocking part so you don't really want to you don't need to know anything else you're, you're like, like damn yeah it's a quote need to know but like it's I didn't very know any of this headline worthy I didn't know any of this like whole victim blame oh, bullshit it gets oh, so much worse. I just heard I just heard the the gist and I was like good enough for me and now it's like oh fuck well it didn't help that you were so little at that point I feel like people who were a little bit older at least could have had more of a grasp of like yeah how fucked up this is or no like at least like looked at the media and been like hey maybe that's not the full story but like you're a kid you get told like this crazy thing happened and like of course you're why would you think anything else people just want to know the gossip not the info which like i totally do so exactly exactly i mean i think we're all guilty of that and um so yeah i think that's why this is just like such a wild story to tell and like needs to be told um and the sinisterhood uh ladies did a great job too covering this and they um they talked about like you know there's so much genital mutilation that happens in um certain parts of the world and it's like that doesn't make the headlines you know it's not like this crazy punchline but this is like what a cuckoo hysterical lady you know so it is a very good like sobering point that this happens a lot to girls and women yeah mostly girls i guess or a lot of times girls and like that doesn't seem to be very exciting for fox news second it happens to a man yeah it's like what i mean even that interview in the beginning you were saying is like she took away the only Only thing a man matters Mm -hmm. the only okay well Yes. That was an ignorant fucking sentence that came out of that guy's mouth. But yes. Okay. Trust me. This guy and his brothers are just Rash. the dumbest. Just like literal gar- literal, gar- literal garbage. Literal garbage. Got it. Uh-huh. <clears throat> so, uh, on, oh, right. She worked at a nail, sal- a nail salon. Guess what's there? So there's, ha, ha, okay. Um, on November 10th, the jury found John not guilty. Wow. Kel surprise. Kel surprise with some followers of the case speculating how could the jury, this is a quote, how could the jury send a man to jail for 20 years for having for having marital relations with his fuck wife? Off, I know. Fuck off. What are you talking about? Okay. Next, Christine, what's next? This is the most infuriating story. Just go well, go ahead. This is the uh this is only one of two trials. We already got through one. Now we have the big show trial. Great. Lorena's trial. Um, la, 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 la. So, according to one of the jury members, Becky Rinker, John's trial was only a playoff game. Okay. Football? Anybody? Whereas... Sports? Sports ball? With a Z? Anybody? Uh, With an omelet? I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, sports? <laughs> sports ball. <laughs> playoff game. <laughs> Help. Help. <laughs> Help me. As I went. Beep, 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 beep. I Somebody. die it. I die it. Somebody take me away. I need I need a big shield in the sky to take me away. Okay, uh, blah, blah, blah. what's even the point of this whole world? Okay, so anyway, <laughs> You're losing it, homie. What is going on? <laughs> this is the fourth episode we've recorded in like forty eight hours. No wonder. Um, yikes! Which means we had to research all this in like the last couple weeks. Okay, so Becky Rinker said this is a playoff game. Lawrence Trial was a Super Bowl. I guess it sort of was. They were like selling merch and shit. So yeah. Um, so they both returned to Manassas Prin- Prince William County Circuit Court in two months for Lorena's trial with charges of malicious wounding. Uh, Lorena and John had very different ways of how they'd spent how they'd spend their time. Uh, 
approaching Lorena's trial. So Lorena had hired Blair Howard to join her defense attorney, uh, to join her defense team as defense attorney and spent her time mostly indoors, staying at her friend and boss's Jana's house, who is kind of a recurring character in this story. Blair explains in the documentary that they decided to put forth a defense, which was a form of insanity in Virginia called irresistible impulse. Irresistible impulse, an incredibly rare plea, is anchored in a proposition that Lorena had undergone a great deal of trauma and that night was the trigger. Oh, okay. She was impacted to such a degree. This is her, def- like her own yes, defense okay. team. Uh, she was impacted to such a degree that she couldn't control her impulse to act out. If in this trial she is found guilty, she was she was to face a 20-year sentence as well as deportation to Venezuela. Mm. Yeah. Also, like, so this, what was it called? The RR, the the, the defense thing? attorney. Then the the, the thing. That oh, the, irresistible impulse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I I. <laughs> that wasn't gonna say it. Irresistible impulse. Okay. Fuck me. Uh, is that just a version of temporary insanity? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a. Uh, they said. Blah, 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 where is it? Um. I guess they don't. Oh yes, a for. But put for the defense, which was a form of insanity in okay. Virginia called it. irresistible. Yeah. So it's like temporary it. insanity. Like she wasn't. I just didn't hear that. In her quote unquote right mind, for lack I'm of a better term. Temporarily fucking insane. Yeah, this I mean, at story this point, is crazy. We're all going to lose it. After a few interviews, John went to live on a ranch. Uh, so this is what Lorraine is doing during this time, preparing uh-huh. her defense, et cetera, laying low. <laughs> Meanwhile, yes? Do you, do you tell the fun uh, thing about what happens to John Wayne? Oh, Bob I tell. Efforts? Okay, because that I tell that and more. <laughs> okay, because that part is like the other part of that's, like what everyone in Virginia. That's knows. the one that I remember. That's the, the only other part I remembered besides somebody was a babysitter. Yeah, was this other part? Well, because everyone, it, everyone that lives in Virginia knows like the Marina Bobbitt caught uh, cut off her husband's penis, and then the, the next. And then so he I, does I wanted to make sure you brought something. it up. Yes, so that happens I think after the um, trial. Gotcha. But it is coming. I promise. Yes. Sorry for the terrible pun. Okay, after a few, sorry, after, <laughs> help, SOS. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, after a few interviews, John went to live on a ranch uh, nearby Colorado Springs to lay low, not really. Uh-huh. Uh, after spending months riding and caring for horses, where he had a girlfriend called Stephanie, John then attended a John Wayne Bobbitt lookalike contest at a Hooters in downtown Colorado Springs. And then. People love going and doing their own fucking lookalike contests to see how much they look like them fucking subs. Have you heard? Who was it that did that and lost? There was somebody who did. Dolly Parton's done that a few times. I think maybe that's what it was. She's lost a few of her. Which own. cracks me. Well, because me like her, her competitors are like all these like. Or like delightful drag queens oh, too, oh, who like yeah. know how to zhuzh up the god in the camp. Oh, sure, and like oh that's gosh. gonna win every day. She got, she's got to walk into that contest and be like, I'm, I'm already a loser. I bet you, Dolly's <laughs> like, yeah, take my crown, take uh-huh. the ribbon. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um. So he enters this John Wayne Bobbitt lookalike contest, and then he makes a guest appearance as a judge on Howard Stern's New Year's Eve pageant, where Howard. Now, can't imagine what that interview was like. Bad, bad. Howard Yikes. Stern. It's a way worse person than I thought. Or at really? Least, oh, yeah. Oh, let's hear it. I want to make sure I put this quote in before I just like try to attempt to misquote it. Um, I don't think it's in here. But uh, at one point during this interview, he said, I don't I don't totally it's something I don't want to misquote it. But so it's not verbatim, but it's something like I don't totally believe he raped her. She's not even that attractive. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, wow. And then it just gets worse. Like, yeah. it just gets really bad. Uh, you know, some of the stuff. Said things like that. The president of the United States. Oh, well, so. assuredly, we're <laughs> not surprised by that. Just to remind everyone. God. The end. Listen, when does this come out? Not November, right? No, probably yeah, October. No, it, too late. Vote. <laughs> too soon and just too late vote. altogether. Please vote. I'll be on a UFO somewhere, but you vote, please. Okay. Yikes. And then maybe I'll come back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> if you get on a fucking UFO and leave me here, I'm be so mad at I'll you. I'll send for you, maybe. No, you won't. I certainly you'll take, won't. You and Akon are going to grab me and Akon. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm stuck here. Okay. Let's go. Okay. So <clears throat> I'll write you a postcard. So uh, he's on this Howard Stern show. It's just like this big spectacle. Not surprising. Um, and that night, Howard Stern raised a total of one hundred ninety thousand um, dollars, and it was charted on a penis meter, a bloody penis meter that he had created. Is like a fund, a fundathon. I don't know, phonathon. I don't uh-huh. like a fundraising thing. Dickathon. Dickathon. <laughs> Yeesh. And um, he raised almost two grand. 
I'm sorry, 200 grand to um, give John Wayne Bobbitt for like his ween. To do what with it? Like another mm. surgery or some shit? They did. He did try to enlarge it. And I think oh. I heard in one source that enlarging it was part of this funding process that Howard Stern wanted to contribute to helping him uh-huh. enlarge the peen. Uh-huh. Alongside other club appearances and radio interviews he then conducted, he would autograph steak knives. Uh, he also didn't disappoint those who thought that one Bobbitt uh, case T-shirt wasn't enough because he decided to make his own and he sold merch. Um, he basically just like ate this whole thing up. Um, yeah. Loved the limelight of it. He, I mean, he definitely is known to have like, he's like, look, if I can get clout out of it and mm-hmm. like at the very least get like make money out of like Ooh, yeah. this, this trauma, like I'll ride that ride. He so. owned it. Uh, he embraced it. So with it then being decided that so Lorena's case uh, was broadcast on TV, whereas his wasn't because it was technically sexual assault case. Right. Um, hers was broadcast because, again, this is also around like the OJ trial, like TV court cases were like a huge thing, you know, yeah. and you can see why, I guess. Yes. Um, I'm sure we would have. I would have watched it. If yeah, I of course. We're not tweeting about it too right or now. whatever. Uh, yeah. Live tweeting it. Um, so. Her case was decided to be broadcast five days before the trial. The prosecutor presented a plea bargain to Lorena's attorney team. If Lorena admitted that the incident was premeditated, she could do four months in jail instead of the whole trial. Uh, But Lorena refused to accept that and refused to admit guilt because if she were to submit to a felony, she would never be able to become a U.S. citizen. And all she wanted was to become a U.S. citizen. Even through all this? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, that was like her dream. So wow. January 10th, 1994, um, the atmosphere atmosphere around the courthouse was like, I mean, as if it were a Super Bowl. 200 reporters were waiting outside, um, hundreds of people with protest signs for both sides. Um, clearly, I don't know what happens at a Super Bowl. I'm sure none of that actually happens at a Super Bowl. You know, everyone packs into a courtroom and everyone's protesting. There's <laughs> Beyonce maybe singing somewhere. Okay. Uh, anyway, again, lucky for people who thought that like these initial two shirts weren't enough more souvenir shirts were made um including ones that bob john bob had so- signed so he'd aut- autographed them um there were also food trucks outside offering quote sausage served on eight inch roll uh and better than sex cake <laughs> like that's wow. not very clever but okay just like that stuff could not fly today right or would it still i like i understand I like know. what it what a cheap way to do like not just for like the food trucks, but like everything from like the shirts and like from the city itself having like the cut, you know, cut above the rest, cut above the rest. <laughs> like, I feel like, I don't know, I guess for, for Listen, the sake of the attention of it all. You but just I feel talked like, about our president. I don't think there's you're right. much improvement. I mean, there's definitely been some improvement, of course, because of things like this. But. I can't imagine the mental turmoil in many ways, obviously, that Lorena had to go through, too, because like, you know, this was such a it became such a publicized thing that was probably so personal. And now there's uh, people out there on food trucks making jokes and like, Oh yeah, totally. Like, and he, this, uh, like her zero husband is on TV, like raising money. Like, look at me. And she's like, and also like Howard Stern helps him earn like six figures, even though she's like, well, fuck off. Like I'm working at a nail salon. He expected both of us to like work off of, to live off of my living. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible situation. And you know, I was just thinking like, I don't know that it would be like in person that crazy. Maybe it would be like with people selling stuff, but like the internet would go haywire and people would sell merch online. Like, I feel like people still gravitate, understandably, like humans still gravitate to stuff like this and like, like a spectacle. (sighs) We love a spectacle. Wow. Um, We do love a spectacle. That's part's true. Yeah. So uh, 60% of the population was watching, like 60% of the US population was watching this case. And whenever CNN would cut away to news of like arms talks, the network would start getting all these complaints, like put back, put the trial back on. (laughs) Holy shit. They're like, there's like war. Nope the trial back on oh my so, god um this trial was different because it wasn't just anymore about what happened that night but it was also a chance for lorena to finally tell her side of the story like before this she's been laying low like her yeah. uh, defense team advised so initially alongside bombarding the jury with imagery of the severed penis um <laughs> which uh b- by the way the fun fact throw in all this um the foreman of the jury clay cocalis commented in an interview that quote she might have thought about going to medical school because the cut she made was such an amazing surgical cut like people 
the surgeons okay. themselves were impressed. They were like, this was just a whoop, like no Spice jagged edges, just wow. right through. Um, <clears throat> so the prosecution showed all these photos of his severed penis to be like, look what she did, you know. And then um, the prosecution went down the line of how Lorena had battered John in the past and that she had always been capable of what she did on the night of the event. John's brothers and sister-in-law took the stand to speak about a time where they were waiting for bumper cars and, quote, all of a sudden Lorena just for some reason got upset and scratched John's face and was punching and John just stood there. Uh, by the way, Lorena was 95 pounds. So, and he was an ex-Marine. So, sorry, but yep. I, I think, let's just remember that. Let's just, yeah. Let's keep Don't that in forget mind. that information as this is happening. Right. One of Lorena's coworkers also testified saying that Lorena had previously said at work that if her husband cheated on her, she would chop his dick off. So that's not a good look either. Uh, this trial was the battle of the sexes. That's what people call it. And uh, as Barbara Walters observed on 2020, I do think that men and women see this very differently. Men see it as a man being mutilated in the most awful way a man could imagine. Many women see it as a woman being abused to such a degree that she struck out at the area that was doing her the most harm. Yeah. And, um, Oh, I also listened uh, on the Mile Higher podcast. They covered this too. I forgot um, a while ago. I listened to that, and uh, they were saying like it was a weapon. Like she saw it as a weapon, and that's sure. I think that makes a whole lot of sense. I agree. The um, this sentiment was echoed by women who were protesting outside the courthouse, chanting "Women fight back." And according to Vanity Fair, feminists supporting Lorena flashed the V for Victory sign, then turned it on its side to go snip snip, <laughs> which is like. Oh! oh that's creative yeah it is yeah um on the third day of the trial when lorena took the stand she recounted the abuse she suffered in the relationship starting from the first incident a mere month after they had married one incident she remembers is when uh they were in the car and he was driving like really he drank a lot too and he was driving really erratically going like 90 miles per hour and she asked him to slow down and he turned and punched her and when they got home began kicking dragged her inside began kicking her yelling at her and when she cried he mocked her for crying and continued to physically abuse her um, at this time an officer officer francis showed up at the door and john like completely changed face and became became like the exact thing you see in a lot of abuse cases of just had this like lovely oh officer everything's fine she's just having like a hissy fit um i'm sorry but like I know what she did wasn't right, but like also like I would drop his fucking dick off oh, too. Oh, it gets to a point where you're like, oh well, like I'm surprised course. it took her that long. Seriously, not that I'm ever advocating to do that to anyone's I'm genitals. Not advocating violence, Obviously. but like I understand currently. Well, you start how to really, there. you do really, you start to understand like, oh shit, like yeah, this was a weapon used against her. Like honestly, um, and so and she was like, I never want that to happen again. Okay, anyway, um, so this officer shows up and John Wayne is Bob is like. Oh, everything's fine. Um, and uh, Officer Francis asked if Lorena had a place to go. And Lorena said she didn't. But she left and spent the night in her car outside of work. When asked whether she told anyone, she said she hadn't because she couldn't understand why it had happened. She was also really young. This was her first relationship. Right. Uh, and was embarrassed to tell people. She goes on to tell the jury how John would repeatedly rape her uh, vaginally, anally, all the time. Just constantly raping her um remembering the emotional abuse she endured he'd get angry if they went to a bar and a man would look at her um any excuse he could find basically um on another account from one of the castro daughters when john and lorena spent christmas with the castro family john gave lorena a present she was like nervous to open it and this was like in front of the family and you know it's a very conservative uh -huh. background um, she opened it to find like skimpy underwear and she was embarrassed and upset and walked away and he followed her push her against the wall saying what's wrong with you walked away and whispered bitch and this was like in front of all these people who were like what the hell wow. um, so the abuse led to her stealing clothes from a Nordstrom store um, and $7,200 from her employer and like she again was being forced to pay for things she couldn't afford the the yeah. mortgage like she couldn't afford and she couldn't find the money he was going to beat her their up lifestyles and yeah and and perfect. right she was always being punished um lorena said i stole because i have a lot of payments to do and i can't handle by myself i stole from nordstrom because he didn't like my dresses and he would always tell me i was so ugly and i wanted to be pretty for him so the amount of abuse she suffered was verified by plenty um, of coworkers saying she'd come into work with marks and on her arms, her throat, bruises on her back and face, even had a bump on her head one time. 
Police who had responded to complaints of domestic violence at their apartment about half a dozen times in the past few years also fi- also testified. Um, and neighbors who Lorena would confide in, there was one named Ella Jones who had suffered domestic abuse herself and who had kind of been like, I see what's going on here, had given Lorena those pamphlets that they had later found about mm. like, right. you know, rape about and domestic abuse. abuse. Yeah. yeah. Um, so two neighbors named Jonathan Kopua and Jonathan Whitaker, who often played basketball with John, testified that they had once heard him say that he liked forced sex and liked to make girls squirm, bleed, and yell for help. Holy shit. Just at a basketball game. Please cut this guy's penis off. Like, yeah. It's like, uh, no fucking wonder. So watching the trial, you can see how the whole recollection of these events is like traumatic, obviously, for her. And ultimately, when asked whether she thought he would kill her, she replied with yes. Uh, Lorena was suffering from massive anxiety, PTSD, which was also seen physically. She was she, she was weighing weighed ninety five pounds at this point. She was clearly very like struggling from her PTSD. Um, Dr. Susan Feister, a forensic psychiatrist, went on the stand to say Lorena suffered from major PTSD and panic disorder. I don't believe she had control over her actions at that period of time as she was experiencing severe distress and her husband psychologically closed off every avenue of escape for her. She became psychotic at the time, so attacked the instrument of her torture. I believe her behavior was consistent with irresistible impulse. Mm. So with all that in mind, Lorena continued to handle this trial like laid low, handled it with grace, being polite. She always addressed everyone as sir and ma'am when asked questions, was just very, like, docile and sure. kind. Submissive. Submissive. Like, like some, well, I feel like that's a negative connotation. Like, she was... Uh, meek? No, no. Like, she was just very, like, graceful. Like, she never... Gotcha. Like, she was very, you know, she told her whole story and was brave and strong in that way, but also was just, like, very measured i guess maybe is a good word for it um and polite so then john bobby was called to the stand uh where the defense knew they had to challenge his credibility um because he says to this day he doesn't believe in violence okay so when shown a questionnaire he had filled out in the past that covered instances of him having previously struck his wife he said he didn't remember that form at all of course so they show him the bottom and say is this your signature and he goes yeah Okay. Okay. The defense also reminded him of uh, February 1991 when he had pleaded guilty in court for charges of battery of his wife. To this, John responded with, I didn't plead guilty to it. I just said, you know, I denied what she stated. I didn't do nothing. I didn't hit my wife or anything. They just said this. So, like, he literally he literally uh, pleaded guilty and then now was like, no, no, I didn't do that. And they're like, but like you like literally too little too late. It's already done. Like, like, I don't know how you're going to refute that. Yeah. We have paperwork it's really weird when asked about the instance where officer francis came to the door on the night he punched lorena um uh, when they were driving and whether john remembered officer francis he says he didn't john also denied drinking that night but when officer francis testified on trial the officer recalls like a strong odor of alcohol on john um, and believed he was drunk john also denies telling anyone he enjoyed forced sex which goes against what his neighbors had testified of about the basketball game right. weird thing to also invent um additionally john provided different information to robert johnston who was staying that night at the bobbits with uh how much they'd been drinking because like i said they were presumed to have been very drunk the night that happened um when remembering the night of the incident john said that he didn't remember having sex with lorena because he was so dead tired so wasn't up for anything that night and only she was touching him <laughs> okay okay uh this goes against what lorena says which is that he raped her that night of the event and um, throughout the whole cross-examination, John Bobbitt continually contradicted himself uh, with newspapers, including the Washington Post, reporting, at times in his testimony, he appeared to confuse even himself, shaking his head in befuddlement. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I've got nothing else to no, say. No, I just feel bad. Like, I'm like, uh-huh, just like, uh-huh. I'm like, just dumping this all just out, but bullshit. there's so okay. much. Okay, this day in court, like, shifted a lot of the media's views on Lorena. Um, The Daily News front cover now read, Why Lorena Bobbitt Did It, She Lived in Fear. And the New York Post headline read, Lorena Was the Real Victim. Oh. So some media really did try to change their, yeah. And, like, change the storyline, yeah. Also, it's kind of shocking to me that it took having to hear the story to think, like, maybe there was a reason why she did it. Yeah, but I feel like it's like you said, like, you hear, like, some lady chop her husband's dick off, and you're like, what? I only all I ever heard was that he was abusive and and he cheated, but like 
that yeah. was it and i never knew what like to what extremity it's of so abuse. easy for people to point out like oh she was just crazy sure yeah so fun um okay so a lot of female reporters had tried to cover the story sympathizing with lorena and domestic violence but a lot of male editors came back and said no one wants to hear about that part so fun worse in court the following day lorena recounted how in 1990 john forced her to have an abortion after telling her she would be a terrible mother and that if she did have a child he would refuse to help <gasps> so yeah forced her to have an abortion because she didn't want one and he said well you have to because otherwise you are abandoned on the street basically um he also hurled more verbal abuse her at her including how she was spanish and didn't deserve him and she was ugly had a bad figure and couldn't speak english uh every time they would fight he would threaten to take away all her immigration paperwork so he used that against her all the time Jesus. like threatening like i can get you deported basically so she, like like it said like closed off he closed off every avenue she had right. of potentially escaping um he would also say how she doesn't deserve to be in this country. Uh, when this was raised in the trial, it was picked up by a local Hispanic radio station who began to lament how um, a fellow Hispanic woman was treated. So some news sources were, you know, being more sympathetic to this case, obviously, than others. Um, the Hispanic community swarmed to support Lorena outside the Judicial Center. Uh, no matter the weather, they were there like every single day to mm -hmm. cheer for her as she entered and left the courthouse. Um, Lorena provided another key bit of evidence that evening on the morning of the 21st, two days before the incident, she had apparently applied for a protective order, which she wasn't granted. Um, and this evidence was then made even more hard hitting by a new crucial witness who took the stand for Lorena's Bo Lorena Bobbitt's case. And uh, they provided uh, support for this argument that Lorena was suffering from PTSD because she had seen Lorena just a few days before the incident. So this was actually a client of hers at the nail salon. Uh, her name's Regina Keegan. And she said on June 17th, she went to get her nails manicured and her eyebrows waxed. And Lorena, you know, was the technician. Sure. And uh, she said the manicure was very bad and that her eyebrows were very uneven afterward. And when starting on Regina's nails, Lorena pulled up her sleeves and Regina knows she was covered in bruises. And Lorena like quickly pulled her sleeves back down. And throughout the manicure, Lorena's breathing changed like she was oh. like out of breath. Um, and she started tearing up. Or there were tears in her eyes. And she said to Regina that if I leave him, he'll kill me. He was going to drop me over the railing. And if people ask me what happened, he'll tell them I jumped. Oh, this oh is gosh. literally the headspace she's in like with days <clears throat> before this happened um, a psychiatrist analyzed Lorena's behavior and deemed it to be behavior of someone who had suffered PTSD and was not in control of her faculties um, unfortunately it was only after John's trial that Regina heard about the Bobbitt case so she wasn't like reading or watching the news very much and so she saw this she saw Lorena on TV and went holy shit like yeah that's I know the one that's who was just talking uh -huh. about. And even though John Wayne Bobbitt had already been uh, not guilty, you know, the jury had deemed him not guilty. She was able to get this news to uh, the defense team before, like during Lorena's trial. So at least right. it made it into her trial. Um, so they used it in the trial as said by Kim Gandy from the national network to end domestic violence quote, this, case came at a time where the criminal justice system didn't take domestic violence and sexual assault seriously. Many women saw this case as an opportunity to bring domestic violence into the public eye with a lot of women who saw themselves in Lorena's plight. So she had a lot of right. people who empathized and understood what she was going through. Uh, on January 22nd, 94, the jury found Lorena Bobbitt not guilty of malicious wounding by reason of insanity. Mm. So it worked, even though it was like a really rare Ir was it irresistible impulse double r double r uh -huh. <laughs> there were two r's in there <laughs> um it, it worked so that was a win for them um Good. so both lorena and john were acquitted essentially in both their trials so because the requirements attached to the verdict of irresistible impulse it did mean that she wasn't totally free right away uh she had to go to central state hospital to have a psychiatric evaluation and was committed for 45 days but thankfully she didn't have to be deported and right. go to prison um so similar to the period between the two trials the aftermath this this is where we get to the point of you really start to see these people's character in the aftermath of this whole situation so okay. Their divorce was finalized in 1995. 
John went on to continue um, <laughs> making entertainment appearances, which included judging a drag queen Lorena lookalike contest. And uh, Look away from me. And also judging Miss Nude 1995. Why? Yeah. The 90s were tough, man. Uh, as well as tried to form a band. Do you know what his band was called? Did you know he tried to form a band? I didn't know that. It's called... The Bobbits or the Penises? The Severed Parts. Okay. Well, good. I bet that band <laughs> fucking ruled. They were so hardcore. Uh, <laughs> he then also tried his hand uh, in the pornographic industry this is the there one i remembered you guys telling me yep. um the the main phrase is oh the lorena baba case you don't know about it basically she cut her husband's penis off and he became a porn star yes and also was deirdre babies she was deirdre's baby star mm -hmm. um do you know the name of the <laughs> of his his porn name his film oh no what john wayne bobbit uncut Ugh! fuck off it told the story of him and lorena um john comments a porno seemed like the best way to show that my penis worked okay oh oh thank you i'm so glad we were all hoping you'd prove it to us i know well in sinisterhood they said that the surgeon actually watched the porno and went oh my god i did that like he put it back on and was like holy shit like, <laughs> which is just the wildest like full circle thing um so he shot to fame with this film as uh, it had its own Hollywood premiere. That's how like big this uh -huh. was. Um, it was apparently the fourth biggest grossing porn film and the grossest in my opinion, but the fourth biggest grossing porn film at the time. Uh, it is rated 4.1 out of 10 on IMDb in case you're wondering. Huh. And I'm sure you were. Did he win a Woody? He, I'm sure he did not. I By think the way, this, for those who don't he know, was a not Woody in, isn't like an Oscar, but in the porn industry. Yeah, and those people are professionals. Uh -huh. This guy's not a professional. I, well, it, it seems like he's like skyrocketing to fame by having really done not as much as the people who work hard for what they earn. So that's true. But fame, I guess, is not maybe the right word. Maybe just like clout. No, definitely he didn't have clout, but like notoriety or yeah. like fascination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, which I feel like doesn't last unless you really have like that's true. Let's just say he wasn't for, great. For all I know, I I just feel like they could have like. He could have gotten a Woody princi on on principle that he was like the well, the story of the year. They did like <clears throat> they did. They were hoping he would become like this. He just was not good at what what they wanted him to do. I guess sex. Yeah. Are we surprised? No. <laughs> no, not at all. But like, it's nice to hear it. <laughs> yeah. So considering the amount of money John had earned through all these mediums, the hospital never got paid for the surgery. Oh. And can you imagine how expensive that nine hour surgery wow. on a penis was? They had to put like the arteries together and stuff Fuck. um so john had to file for bankruptcy and like howard stern raised him 200 grand whatever um so not even two years later john then gets called back to court for another domestic violence case with his then girlfriend christina elliott he completely denied the allegations but was found guilty and spent Oh, 60 days in jail only a hot six zero <sighs> the first porn success then led john to seek penis enlargement um that was documented in it's highly in a highly anticipated follow-up film called now this is the one i was wondering if you remembered the name john wayne bobbitt's franken penis mm -mm, i didn't know that one i sure do now apparently it was a botched surgery uh Wait, the storyline in the porn no, the real surgery oh oh they the guy just injected a bunch of fat into it apparently and um, apparently it ultimately ended in Dr. Rosenstein, who performed the, the surgery, uh, closing his practice. But the film got a 5.1 out of 10 on IMDb. Well, there you go. Well, moving on up to that Woody Award. Yep. Uh, in 98, John started to work as a celebrity greeter at um, what they called a brothel in Nevada called the Moonlight Bunny Ranch. Um, his employers there tried to get him like to be a bartender, but he was really drunk all the time. So... That wasn't working. Hmm. Um, he also was supposed to drive the limo. We know how that goes uh, with his driving. Uh -huh. He also just like couldn't do a job right. Like they'd be like, here, can you please serve? Well, he never worked a day in his life. He fucking exactly. lived off of his wife. Exactly. So. And thought he could now live off his quote unquote fame or uh -huh. infamy, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so he just was bad at every type of job they were trying to give him. And apparently, oh, well, I guess I'll just read the quote. According to the escorts who worked there, John used to think that everyone who came by the ranch was there for him and he'd engage in two hour conversations with clients. Um, and I'm sure these clients were like, no, thanks. We're not here for you and your weird Franken penis, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Um, John stole around $140,000 worth of clothing from a store around this point. He claimed to be a celebrity and demanded for shop assistants to give him free clothes. Uh, he was caught when he tried to return the clothes to different stores of the same chain and was given a five-year probation. In 1999, John didn't show up to his 32nd birthday party, which was hosted at the Bunny Ranch. Um, which is when the owners realized that John had gone on the run with one of their escorts who worked there, a 19-year-old woman called Desiree. They had started a relationship at the ranch, but uh, this was like a big no-no for an employee, uh, John, to sure. be, you know, having a relationship yeah. Yeah, with, with one of the women who worked there, but they like stole off into the night. Um, and Desiree drove them to Niagara Falls where she secured John an apartment because he had no money. This sounds familiar. Unfortunately, this relationship ended in domestic violence and reached a really, really bad point where Ugh. he was dangling Desiree off the balcony <gasps> by her legs, threatening to drop her. Holy fuck. Which is what, remember, Lorena was like, if this happens, he'll dangle me and he'll yeah. drop me and say, I I'll, jumped. I, yeah. So apparently this is something he does. Um, he then, and this was witnessed by other people, uh, which is disturbing because of what happens next. So he then tied her to the bed where she suffered three days of torture, <gasps> where he told her that she was his Lorena now. <gasps> Guess how she fucking escaped. Like, this is a wild story. Did she cut his penis off too? <laughs> she's like, <laughs> did she do it again? No. Since she's a Lorena? I what? wish. What? No. And that point, just slit the goddamn throat at that point. Oh my Eesh. God. She had to play dead. Because he was, like, beating her and stuff. And she was, like, the only way I can get out of this. By the way, I'm so happy that that person got out of that situation. That's what I'm saying. It's so close. Good for you if Such you're listening. a close call. Especially because, so she played dead, waited for him. He got, like, a blanket to throw over what he thought was her literal dead body. And then as he turned to kind of, like, move her body somewhere, she literally got up and just fucking ran for it. So, like, the fact that she escaped is, thank Christ, but, like, so scary. Um and again, like this stuff isn't covered in these, like in the early stories. Literally, I mean, had no fucking clue. Also, I, I wonder, like, if I were Lorena, I would have thought the second that all the court stuff was over, he'd be coming to the house to fucking kill me. Yeah, like, I'd be like out of there. I'd be like, I'm never being in Virginia again. Or at You'll least never fucking. See at me. least the second. I don't think he even was like that mad at her because he was like, "Look at what you've, you've just done got for me, me this like great yeah. fame." Quote, Ugh, quote. I would be so. I'd be like, if he was almost gonna kill me every day before i cut off his penis like he's definitely gonna kill me now oh yeah well i'll tell you maybe what, that's is, is that why sorry i don't mean to keep no, no. is that then why he was saying like you're my lorena and he was like getting back at lorena by like almost killing her and I essentially wonder. killing her yeah maybe wow okay actually Thanks. yeah probably he was just now projecting it onto somebody else Ooh. um he certainly did that i never heard this part of the story ever oh my gosh it's so crazy okay in 2003 he was arrested again on another abuse charge spent 15 months in why are people dating this man that's what i'm saying well maybe they don't know because nobody's reporting on it that's that's a great point yeah not trying to fucking victim blame here i'm just wondering like if i if i knew that man existed and then he came out to me and said let's go well, on a date i'd like, be like get he's the fuck very away from good me. at victimizing vulnerable manipulating people. probably because like he finds vulnerable people right and then just like tells him to give him what he wants it's just it's i think it's just mind-blowing to me that someone who pulls shit off like that can continually get away with it it's just so oh yeah gross it's gross it's baffling quite frankly <sighs> Um, anyway, I did not mean to victim. No, anyway, no, no, I'm just you so didn't. Confused how no, you he's didn't. still landing but it's anybody? Because like these people didn't. These people, I don't mean like that, but like people didn't necessarily know this, and no, there was no a, internet. Nothing was going viral on Twitter or like. Point. It just not everyone saw that side of it. Yeah, actually, most people didn't. Um, so she escaped. Thank God. Um, so many things like happened. He remarried twice. Uh, what? Okay. I know. He <laughs> underwent another battery case with his third wife. Uh, apparently he broke his neck at one point. Like this guy just can't calm the fuck down. So wow. <laughs> he can't calm his tits as I always say. Uh, now age 53, he still lives in Nevada. And uh, in interviews, he still holds on to how Lorena was prone to jealousy and that he's a Marine. He's trained to protect people. How is he not in jail? I don't understand how he's not in jail for all of those 
assault all of charges. the above like at some point wasn't a judge like hey you got off scot-free and then you kept doing it and then you months kept you doing it 15 months he got for like the fourth that one. man should be in jail for the rest of his fucking life agreed um he said and that i this sounds like the fucking quote we used he never used he said he never used violence against another person pretty much ever which sounds like pretty much always, always never, never <laughs> sometimes often for Lorena, upon release from the hospital after, after the court ruled that she no longer needed to be hospitalized, she returned to her life as a manicurist wanting to keep a low profile and lead a simple life. All she wanted, she said, was to get her American dream. She regularly attended Catholic church, reconnected with her family, decided she wanted to go back into education. She enrolled in community college, and she was approached by obviously so many different media outlets. Um, and whereas John like fucking ate that shit up, she was offered a million dollar nudity offer from Playboy and refused. Um, so, what? wow, I know. Okay. And she said, "No, I don't want that." Which right. is like that alone, I think, is proof that it's, she wasn't doing this for the attention. Or it's the fame. a perfect expression of like their values of their values and what they stood for this entire time. Like, like she was never there for the like, for the fame of it. Yes, and like what this case meant because for him it was like I'm taking advantage of this. For her it was like it was just an escape route. Like it wasn't She's like I just wanted to cuz penis off and didn't have do to it. leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. It's like Le- actually, just wanted him to leave me alone. That was her phrasing like all she said she really? said late she says later I just want him to leave me alone cuz by the way he doesn't but you'll hear about <gasps> that in a moment. Um okay. Oh my god, there's more? So Christine. she does agree to a TV movie which supported her in paying le- her legal bills, but then she donated the rest of the money to a trust. Um a year after her release from the hospital, Lorena began going to shelters to share her story of domestic violence and to hear other stories. Uh it was at community college that she met uh David Bellinger and they started off as close friends and then married. They're still together, have a 13-year-old daughter named Olivia and live near Lorena's family. So Thank God. Happy ending. Aww. Lorena still lives in North Virginia. She continues to go to local shelters and every year delivers Christmas presents to mothers and their kids at the the shelters. Um, Lorena received many love letters from John Wayne Bobbitt. Uh, what? That she does not ever reply to. So some of them, here's one example. A lot of them read along the lines of, I miss you. If there was a choice of any woman in the world, I choose you. I love your heart. I thought about you today. You made me smile. We would make a lot of money if we were back together. If you had a baby, there would be a lot of people out there that would love to exclusive interview me and you. John would often sign it Ew, with... so it's still like... Yes! It's still like that gross masculine thing of like, oh, look, if I got you pregnant, it'd be proof that my hey, penis worked and remember everyone when would be I, so like, proud of me. Remember when I forced you to have an abortion? Well, now you should have yeah. a baby because I want to go on the news. Now you should have a baby so I can asshole. prove that I can ejaculate still. Fucking ma- man asshole. Man asshole, truly. <laughs> and she actually moved to Stafford. So oh! She's not in man Is that in anymore. Virginia? It's closer to Fredericksburg. Is that North Virginia? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Because that's what I, I was like. I don't know. It's northern. It's northern yeah. Virginia. Yeah. It's like it's like the city kind of like right above Fredericksburg. Oh, okay. Um, so Lorena has made TV appearances on programs, including Steve Harvey, but is always sure to advocate and shine a light on domestic violence. Um, oh, sorry. I meant to say John would sign off his letters from your cold and sensitive husband. And in the documentary, when she's looking through them, she responds to the cameras with, I cut his penis off. Just leave me alone. Which is like exactly what we said. I just wanted to cut his penis off so he'd leave me alone. Which, yep. Yeah. So it didn't work. The fact that he can still say, I miss you. It's like, Ugh, you sicko. really need to get your fucking head screwed on. Like, like, really take a fucking look at yourself. Yeah. God, it's you're right. It's just something's wrong. And I, I can guarantee he doesn't even mean it. It's just manipulative. Oh, like, yeah. Just to like reel back he's immediately in. like, I want to impregnate you so I can get famous. Yeah. Like, oh. And then I want to punch you in your fucking face, yeah. probably. What an awful mm-hmm. man. Um, on, so she has made appearances on TV, including Steve Harvey, but is always sure to advocate and shine a light on domestic violence. When recalling to Vanity Fair about a time she went to Knoxville to speak um, at a law review, she said, the president of the school introduced me as a celebrity. I said, thank you, but let me correct you. I am not a celebrity. I am an advocate. Uh, she continues to volunteer at her daughter's volleyball team and has a nonprofit called Lorena's Wed- Red Wagon that helps survivors of domestic violence. And this docuseries I mentioned, Lorena, on Amazon is just incredible because it does look at this from that whole new perspective that a lot of people don't know. Um, and it's produced by Jordan Peele's production company. So that's how you know it's good. He's just right. one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, uh, his production company called Monkey Paw and directed by Joshua Rofe. It's four episodes long, um, just brilliant and like really just, and it interviews John Wayne Bobbitt and he just looks like such a tool the whole time. 
If you look at a picture of him, you know he's a he piece of shit. He just looks tool. exactly like he what and his brothers to are the fucking worst. Um, so it frames the case in like this greater historical moment of like domestic violence and how it was viewed then versus now versus like what has changed, what hasn't changed. Um, so these references include other cases like uh, Anita Hill's harassment case, the O.J. Simpson case, Tanya Harding. It's just all very like timely and relevant for right. that time period. Um, the docuseries mentions how at the time in 93, there wasn't a hotline for domestic violence victims. There there wasn't funding for shelters. But then in 1995, $46 million worth of funding was allocated to support the, the Violence wow. Against Women Act, which I'm pretty sure like last, last year was defunded again, which fucking we can't win. Um, Great. Yeah. Uh, with more recent events, including like obviously... <laughs> Harvey Weinstein, Donald Trump, Me Too movement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One of the two most popular of them is the president of our country. <laughs> Should be a ringing endorsement for uh, <laughs> for this <laughs> bullshit right here. <laughs> to It needs to be stopped. <laughs> Morse code? I'm leaving. I'm following my UFO. Okay. You think the aliens know Morse code to help you out? No, they probably are pretending they don't, so they don't have to pick me up. Okay. Lock the doors on the way. <laughs> yeah, literally Half lock Earth. the doors. Um, okay, sorry. So... Because of all the recent stuff happening and probably fucking forever and ever infinity and beyond, uh, the series also reminds us that we are not in that much of a different place, unfortunately, to how it was in 93. Um, and if you have suffered domestic abuse or you know somebody who ha who has, um, there is now, thank God, a domestic abuse hotline. You can call 1-800-799-SAFE. And that is the story of Lorena Bobbitt. Sorry wow. that was so flipping long, That's but been waiting for a long time to cover that since like 2017 when we first started the show oh my gosh yep that's a that's a pretty crazy one yeah. well i knew i didn't like john bobbitt john wayne bobbitt but wow i really fucking hate that guy yeah, he's a bad man wow. and like so is howard stern what the fuck you know i don't know i i try to do that thing where i empathize and, and i'm like maybe like now that time's gone on, he's learned. Well, and he's not the same. They made a point now? in the part two on Sinister where they said listeners wrote in and said, like, yeah, he actually has he's grown improved a lot. But then they were like, I just they were like, oh, we just wish he would like say something like address it now that the documentary's out. Maybe he could say like, right. hey, that was really fucked up of me. And I played a huge part in this. It wasn't yeah. even an offhanded comment either. It was like he addressed a it whole himself. spectacle no oh. that like he had this penis meter and right, was paying right, right. for his enlargement surgery and said all sorts of like horrendous he, he, like, stuff allowed him to be able to live comfortably and keep being a piece of shit and all that so, correct yeah and i and i don't want to like try to de defend someone I, that i don't know either side of but like i like to think since the 90s someone has called him out on his bullshit and like he's yeah. grown but i agree like it could yeah be and apparently he thank god is like more sensitive now i guess from what sure. i've heard at least but yeah it would probably help a lot of people if you made a made a statement but then we'd anyway, probably be the, waiting in, that's just tip of the iceberg on this fucking story saying, anyway we'd be waiting in line forever if we got a statement from everyone who yeah. needs to make a statement anyway on that note thank you for listening to our really long episode i'm so sorry wow hope you are having a great time on that road trip <laughs> hope you got six up i'll swing by and pick you up on my ufo yeah <laughs> so i'll be there soon just look out the window oh my gosh well uh wherever lorraine is and wherever your family is now i'm glad that you are in a much safer space. Me too. Um, if you want to learn more about us, you can go to andthatswayweedrink.com or check us out on social media at ATWWD Podcast. And until next week. And that's why we drink. We drink.